uh, to fight uh, this uh, terrible disease. I want to thank uh, also our scientists and medical uh, therapeutic industry who has very generously uh, supported our government's effort in uh, fighting COVID. Um, even though we will not be able to gather together as we normally would at C3, we can use this opportunity to share our ideas and exchange uh, greetings. I want to thank uh, our today's uh, esteemed faculty member who has taken uh, the time out of their very busy schedule to be with us uh, this morning uh, to be part of uh, this uh, important uh, session. Uh, so without further ado, we'll uh, start rolling here. And I'd like to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, uh, Darshna Jani, who is a very well-known uh, uh, scientist in biopharmaceutical industry. Uh, she supported research and development of cold uh, attenuated influenza virus vaccine, which is marketed as the flu mist nasal spray now. Uh, currently, uh, she's a director at uh, A uh, Genus uh, uh, Corporation and supports uh, oncology clinical trials. Uh, uh, she's a master in uh, science and has uh, worked uh, in the virology field for many years and as the uh, author of uh, many publications and speaks uh, almost worldwide uh, uh, on uh, different uh, subjects related to uh, biopharmaceutical industry. So she's going to do a brief uh, uh, introduction of basics of SARS-CoV-2 virus and pathobiology of the uh, disease. Darshana. She's muted. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can unmute her. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Perfect. And can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Thank you. OK, great. Uh, thank you, Academy, for inviting me to this interesting webinar. We are in really unprecedented, unprecedented times. Uh, where we are all from healthcare to civil liberties, we are all impacted one way or the other. And I think it is important that we know our basics, what is the basic structure, and um, then move on from there. So my topic is coronavirus biology. Um, I'm hoping I am in presentation mode. Um, can you see? Uh, can you see my slides in presentation mode? Yes, I you can so. see it perfectly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I will start with a disclaimer that information which is compiled here um, is mainly from CDC and World Health World Health Organization related websites. Also, uh, I have in my brief talk, I'm going to give a very high level overview of um, uh, coronavirus classification, then move into morphology, then go into the mode of action a little, and then end with some closing thoughts. So COVID-19, as we all know, coronavirus infectious disease 2019 is caused by coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2, um, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, COVID-2. The nomenclature started as 2019 novel coronavirus. So in some literature, we might see it, it is referred as 2019 novel coronavirus. And then later on, the nomenclature changed to SARS-CoV-2. Um, if we look at where this virus belongs into the family of the viruses, it is a NIDO, it belongs to NIDOVIRALS, which has four families, Artroviridae, Mesonviridae, Roniviridae, and Corinaviridae. As we can see on the slide with the green color, Coronaviridae is the biggest family in, um, in this classification. This classification of coronavirus is organized based on genomic sequences, um, properties of um, surface protein, their structural characteristic, their cytopathogenic effect, and physicochemical properties. 
the coronavirus or the coronavirus viruses are further classified into four species alpha beta gamma and delta uh, today we are going to focus little bit more on alpha and beta gamma, gamma coronaviruses are considered the mild viruses um, so if we look at the coronavirus family coronavirus species in 1937 human coronavirus 229e was recognized which was alpha coronavirus and then quickly uh, the strain of oc43 was identified uh, in 1967 and then until 2002 the sars coronavirus which was identified and now we are into the seventh one which is here in red human SARS coronavirus 2, which is a beta coronavirus. And it is believed very, very briefly that there is a cross species jump for SARS coronavirus and the MERS coronavirus. It started with bat coronaviruses. Um, and then through the intermediate host, it spilled over to humans. And the current theory, even though there are debatable theories, there are information changing still every day. Uh, we believe that the current human COVID-2 has originated from bad coronavirus and through the host of pangolin, now it has jumped to the human. How coronavirus 2 is different from the original SARS-CoV, it is based on the spike protein. With that brief inf information, I will jump into the morphology. So the coronaviruses are large envelope RNA virus. And if we look at relative sizes with the other biological organisms, so the size varies anywhere between 100 to 160 nanometers. So within the virus family, um, it is large, but it is not the extra large. Uh, if we really look at the structure of coronavirus, the image I have used is published from CDC and is fairly accepted in the field of science. Um, so the outer structure of this coronavirus has a spike protein, which gives it a name. It looks, it makes it look like a crown. So that is the nomenclature crown. Um, in, uh, in Latin, it is corona. So that gave it a name. This spike protein has two subunits. First is called S1, which contains the receptor binding domain. And this is the domain which has very high affinity to angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which is ACE2. Um, the second subunit, which is S2, is host cell membrane fusion protein. <clears throat> Structural protein or this spike protein is the one which makes it very attractive for utilizing for diagnostic purposes or therapeutic purposes. The other three structural proteins, um, there is a membrane protein which is, which is also spiking out. It gives shape and structure to virus. There are small envelope proteins which are also involved in the shape of the virus. And the important part, the outer surface, which is derived from the host cell. Um, this surface is made up of lipoproteins, which is the fatty layer of the surface. surface. And that is what is directly applied to the principles of washing hands with the soap, that it disrupts the layer. Um, inside this outer layer, there is a capsid, which is a protein shell which encloses the genetic material, which, which is nucleoprotein, which is nucleic acid bound to the protein. And the nucleic acid for this virus is single-stranded positive sense RNA, which allow, which allow it to replicate itself. Uh, with that little bit on the uh, replication cycle, again, the information is evolving every day. 
But here I have used the reference, which is very recently published from the Cornell University. Uh, so the virus can infect the host cell in one of the two ways. Um, so pathway one, um, uh, if you look at 2A, uh, that is there is a plasma membrane protein which are called transmembrane protease uh, or sarin proteases. So there is one way the spike proteins and the virus can bind. The other way could be the ACE2 receptors which are expressed on the cells. So virus binds using the spike proteins one of the two ways and then it endos if it goes through ACE2 uh, receptor, if you look at step three, it goes into the end. It, endos it internalizes itself into the endosome and then the pH of the endosome um, is very low, it disrupts the membrane and the nucleic acid or the RNA of the virus is cleaved into the cytoplasm of the host cell. Um, then the RNA polymerase and other host cell machinery as well as other proteins come into the picture to assemble the virus again and through the exocytosis, the virus is released outside. It is believed based on this publication that in lung cells, uh, in lung, the internalization is through TMPSS, that, um, TMPRSS2. And the other organs, it is due to S2 binding. Um, but theories are emerging every day. Um, but this is the current um, current theory in the field of science. Um, if we look at one of the examples that how the coronavirus infects lungs, just for uh, you know the understand understanding of biology. Once the virus enters into lungs, it reaches to alveoli and infects type two pneumocytes. <clears throat> Now that is where the debatable practice comes in, that uh, type two pneumocytes has S2 receptors on the surface, and it also has T TM TM2 uh, membrane proteins. Uh, but either way, uh, the virus att attaches to the alveoli plasma membrane, internalizes, and at the same time, the host own immune system start acting up. A lot of immunomodulators are released, which ultimately activates um, uh, and mediates the cytokine production. And that increases the capillary permeability, ultimately leading to vasodilation and other complication. This two, uh, yeah, S2 inhibitor is also highly expressed in heart, in kidney, in liver, and in gut tissues. And that is how the virus infects the other organs in the human body. Um, based on the replication cycle, which are the seven or eight different steps, um, the therapeutic intervention can occur at different stages. Here I have shown the two examples. We all know yesterday remdesivir uh, has been approved for the emergency situation. But I have here shown two examples which were uh, discussed a lot, uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. So chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine can pass through the host cell membrane. And then virus is, virus is in endosome uh, due to the alkaline nature of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Um, it, in, it impacts the pH and does not allow the lysosomal enzymes to activate. So it, uh, chloroquine and hydrochloroquine may uh, impact the first step of a replication cycle, and that's how inhibits the virus replication. Uh, in contrast, remdesivir directly impacts the RNA polymerases, and direct so remdesivir itself is a nuclear um, 
adenosine analog so it directly impacts the rna structure it directly in impacts the rna polymerase and uh, impacts the replication that way so as i uh, earlier said and i will reiterate myself that the no information the knowledge um, is evolving some of the data is very much based on in vitro um, in vitro analysis how it translate into human still needs to be seen but at least this is where we stand right now uh, so with my closing thought uh, that yes it is a highly infectious human virus we all agree viral genome has been sequenced um, so there are a lot of opportunities out there uh, to work on therapeutics, to work on diagnosis, to work on the vaccines. Uh, and the very good part is medical advances um, throughout the global researchers is shared real time. And that is why the efforts are really, um, uh, efforts are real time and advancing very fast. Currently, more than 250 clinical trials are moving with aggressive timelines. Uh, however, the vaccines are very eagerly awaited for all of us, for all our safety. And the very, very final thought I will end with is let us all lead by science and not a lot of discussion, not, of, not uh, by hype on any news. With that, I again thank you all for listening and thank you, Academy, for providing me the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darshana, for that insightful presentation. So we'll have some chance of a discussion and a questions later on, but in the interest of the time, we'll continue with the next presentation. And now uh, it's my um, uh, privilege to invite Chris Quinn, who is a molecular lab scientist and a team leader at the Diagnostic Laboratories in Vanderbilt University uh, Medical Center in Greater Nashville area, and has been involved in uh, COVID testing from really, really early on. She's uh, that lab was one of the first ones to uh, start doing uh, uh, COVID testing. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn over to Chris for a very important topic on current state of COVID-19 testing in the United States. What are the different type of test uh, applicability and interpretation? Welcome, Chris. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much, Dr. Dave, for the opportunity to uh, share some insights from the lab perspective with you all. Um, and I am very grateful to be um, part of this panel of very prestigious speakers. Um, and so without further ado, um, I'm going to share some of the current state of COVID-19 testing in the US, uh, some of the testing that's available, uh, applicability, and a little bit of the interpretation side. I think that you guys um, will probably know more about that interpretation side than we do. Um, so some talking points that I wanted to cover um, the first one would be what's currently available out there in the market um, and what is actually useful. There's so many um, vendors that are starting to come out with their own tests. Uh, the FDA is approving kits uh, for emergency use authorization, um, just like from out of nowhere very quickly. So um, we have had to evaluate a lot of those in the lab and not all of them are unfortunately usable. Um, I'm going to compare a few of the diagnostic testing methods um, and some testing considerations. So there are two main types of diagnostic tests for COVID-19. Um, the most common right now is the molecular method and there's also the serological method. Um, what we use mainly at Vanderbilt at the moment is viral molecular assay. Um, and this is uh, very useful because it can help diagnose active infection and it's extremely sensitive. The assay that was uh, first emergency use authorized by the FDA actually had a sensitivity of one copy 
per microliter. Um, and this is the model that we used for what we brought up uh, for testing so that we could start uh, using it for infection prevention at the hospital. Um, there are a few commercially available assays that I personally like and would vouch for, um, and I'm going to list a few of them. Um, the first is the Cepheid Expert Express SARS-CoV-2 assay. Um, it is about 30 minutes to a positive result. This is very specific. There's a uh, low false negativity rates and it's a low complexity assay, which means it can probably be ran at point of care if the uh, personnel has the proper protective uh, equipment. Uh, this is also random access. So when the instrument is running and there's a free bay, you can keep on loading samples as you go. Um, the second one is the BioFire COVID-19 test. Um, BioFire is very well known in the respiratory industry for testing. They have come out with their respiratory pathogen panels, which has proven very useful for us during this pandemic. A lot of our patients, we will usually screen for COVID-19 and also put on the respiratory pathogen panel just to see if there's a co-infection. Um, this is a very reliable technology and it's also random access. Uh, the Genmark Eplex is another player in the market. Um, it has a longer runtime because of the reverse transcription that happens with this virus. Um, this has uh, some false negativity that we've uh, seen. So every now and then, if the patient really has some clinical presentations, we will go back and confirm with another assay. There's also some difficulty obtaining reagents for this test because it's a smaller um, vendor. The um, fourth one is the Diasorin Simplexa COVID-19 Direct Kit. This also has a runtime of about 1.5 hours. Um, these are batch runs and re reagent availability is still questionable. So um, when we first started testing at Vanderbilt, we ran into the same problems everybody in the world had, which was a limited supply. Uh, at one point, we even ran out of uh, viral transport media. So we had to actually make our own and we've been making our own since then. Um, we also uh, ended up uh, using a lab developed test that's a modified CDC uh, assay and we um, verified uh, it using four different extraction methods for RNA so that we would uh, never run out. So we have actually not stopped testing and we are close to um, hitting the 30,000 mark for samples tested. Um, the last one that I wanted to share, I'm not a big fan of it, but we do have 10 of this, uh, is the Abbott ID now COVID-19. This has been all over the news. Um, it's five minutes to a positive result. It's um, 15 minutes to a negative one. This is extremely low sensitivity. The assay has a flaw in it where the samples are extremely diluted. Um, there is about a 70 to 80% false negativity rate for this instrument. Um, some uh, interpretation of viral molecular assays are pretty much the same. Um, the one that we currently use is based on the original CDC probe assay and all the other emergency use authorization kits have kind of followed this model. So I'm going to share a little bit about, um, about it. So the uh, assays are usually targeting a region of the NCOV nucleocapsid uh, gene. Um, all of the samples have to be tested for human RNAs, uh, the RNP gene to assess for specimen quality. And this comes into play later and I'll explain a little bit about why it's very important. Uh, this assay probe must be detected in all our samples so that we know that there's sufficient collection. Uh, the RNA viruses also show a lot of genetic variability. As you guys know, it uh, can frequently mutate. And uh, although efforts were made to design the RTQ-PCR assays to um, be very specific, there is going to be some variability in the mismatches. Um, the original CDC assay actually included four probe sets to account for this, um, but the, the, we ended up taking out one because it was very unspecific for the assay. The second kind of test available in the market is the serological test. And this is the up and coming um, promising test out there, although the utility is in question still. 
Um, and the serological test, as many of you may know, is uh, used to detect the presence of antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. Um, and this is mainly useful to identify patients who are already infected, symptomatic or asymptomatic with COVID-19. Uh, we have tested two different vendors for this, uh, for serological testing, and we are seeing a lot of cross-reactivity with the other coronaviruses that normally circulate uh, during respiratory season, and there are four. Um, it seems like anyone with HKU1 is also coming up positive for, for some of the antibody testing for SARS-CoV-2. Um, a little bit of the science behind it, um, the presence of IgM antibodies uh, indicate recent exposure to COVID-19, um, and IgG usually indicates later infection. Uh, from experience, we've tested about 2,000 patients. What we've seen is that this IgM rarely comes up. Uh, it may come up like a week after exposure, if, if it does. The IgG is a little bit more reliable, um, but this hasn't been coming out in patients that only have upper respiratory tract uh, infections. It seems to be coming out with patients that really had severe manifestations of COVID-19. Um, all of these assays are based on a technique called uh, ELISA, the enzyme-linked immunological assay that you know, has been out uh, in science for, for almost forever. Uh, how long does it take to get results with serological tests? Um, they are typically faster than standard molecular assays. The uh, FDA has authorized several out in the market and most of them deliver results in about 15 minutes. Um, Abbott is also a player in this, so I've actually didn't include them in this slide. As we have not started uh, trying them out, but the, um, the reagent availability for that assay is uh, apparently better than, than all of the other vendors. Um, how accurate are serological tests? Um, because it can take several days for the body to develop an antibody response to the virus. Uh, serological testing may not be useful to identify a current infection alone. Uh, this is where uh, I would still probably highly recommend that we use PCR testing, um, especially the point of care devices to just screen patients that are coming in for elective surgeries. Um, serological testing uh, has really shown a lot of false negative results on our end. Um, it can be useful for identifying individuals with infection and have recovered, and so this may come into play later when we uh, investigate more into plasma therapy and, and, um, and immunity. Uh, some testing considerations. Uh, we also need to really look into sample collection. And this is where that RNA speed gene has been very important for my lab. Um, some of the self-collect samples, they had uh, some drive-through testing done as well. It seemed like the collection was rushed and we were seeing a lot of false negative results. And a lot of these samples we could see that the RNA speed gene actually didn't amplify very well. So we would reject those and ask for recollect. But this is very important um, because to really uh, collect a good nasopharyngeal sample, you really have to go up there and it's not comfortable for a lot of patients. <coughs> um, and this comes uh, you know, into the next uh, category, which is the collection technique. So there are some some hospitals where uh, they do allow patients to self-collect or their providers to self-collect and send it to a, a reference lab for testing if they do not have the um, capacity in-house to test. This was happening a lot in New York from what I heard. Um, if they have providers exposed, they would tell them to self-collect and send it to LabCorp or Quest, one of the bigger labs in the US. Um, another big, the big factor for testing availability has really been reagent and equipment av av availability. Um, thankfully, our lab had been equipped with what we needed, um, and I had some significant training actually in Iceland in decode genetics for high throughput sequencing. Um, so we were uh, more than ready for this, uh, but we still were overwhelmed. Um, high complexity lab and uh, personnel availability. Uh, because of the RNA extraction step, it, this has been a challenge to find personnel that uh, is licensed and can handle the high complexity. 
uh, earlier on during the peak, we actually had to petition the governor of Tennessee to release licensing requirements for diagnostic scientists in the state. And we allowed some PhD students to come and help us with this step. Um, point of care operations, this is probably gonna be the biggest uh, factor uh, moving forward as the state start to reopen. Um, we have started elective surgeries and have put some of these uh, in our cardiac cath labs, um, some in our cancer uh, testing labs and in, in our transplant clinics. Um, utility and infection prevention um, is very important. This has really allowed us to keep um, hospital acquired infections at bay. Uh, we have not actually been overwhelmed with patients since the pandemic started, thanks to the early uh, testing that we, we did. I'm sharing a quick slide from uh, the Worldometer. Um, and as you can see uh, on the far right, there's the test for 1 million population. And the USA, I mean, our country is actually doing okay, but not as good. Um, population base wise, we could really be doing more for testing. Um, and a lot of this is, I think, uh, the issue with reagent and equipment availability. And I, I know there's no time for questions, so I'm gonna skip that part. Um, thank you guys so much. And I hope I didn't go really fast. So everybody who's really runs the show. No, that's not. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, we have one question uh, from yes. the uh, audience, Dr. Farshal in uh, uh, Tacoma, Washington. Um, he's asking, uh, what is the false negative rate when we do Cepheid expert test? So this is actually one of my favorite tests. It's probably got a false negativity rate of almost 1%. It's extremely low and it's very sensitive. So I had just placed an order to buy more of this uh, analyzer actually. It's, it's very fast um, and uh, you can have almost anyone collect the sample and put it into the instrument. That's fantastic. How, how, how fast is how fast? This is 30 minutes for the, the expert, yes. Uh, the problem with the Abbott test is even if it's five minutes for the ID now, if it's negative, you still have to confirm it using a different assay. Any other questions from the panelists? A uh, quick question, does um, cross-reactivity with the other coronavirus uh, convey any immunity? And I know you probably don't know the answer to that, so I'll take speculation. It uh, doesn't appear like it does. Um, we actually pulled random plasma from uh, two years ago and tested about 2,000 of them. And it did seem like, you know, some of the patients that we saw come up with COVID-19 had HKU1 before and came up with IgM for COVID-19 So I, I, and IgG. So I really feel like there, there may not be an immunity to it. And then Thank you. Quick corollary question. Do kids seem to be spared from this? Theories on that? I'm sorry? Can uh, you children, children don't seem to get it and theories on that? Um, they, it, it seems like we are seeing a lot of children actually. Our positivity rate on children is a little bit high. They are not severely sick, but they are, um, they have some upper respiratory tract infections. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Chris, for taking the time today to be part of it. Uh, uh, you're doing a wonderful work. And uh, let's uh, continue on. And now we're gonna get into uh, the nitty gritty of our specialty, which is cardiology. And uh, for our next uh, lecture, preparing the cardiologists and cath lab uh, from COVID-19 exposure, donning, doffing, and everything in between. Uh, we have Dr. Jeff Chambers, who is part of the Scientific Organizing Committee of C3. He's an interventional cardiologist at Metropolitan Heart and Vascular Institute in Minneapolis. He's a very well-known uh, speaker um, uh, everywhere. Uh, has been uh, part of uh, many uh, clinical trials and many innovative uh, uh, devices. So uh, it's great to have you, Jeff. And uh, I know you've been doing a great work in the, in the lab over there. The preparation has been spectacular. So we look forward to hearing it. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let me share my screen here. There we go. Okay, can everybody see that? 
Yep. Yes, we can see. Yes, it. yes, we can. Perfect. Okay, so um, as Raj said, I'm going to talk about uh, how we prepare the cardiologists and the cath lab, donning, doffing, and everything in between. Um, we first need to start to understand a little bit about the mechanism of the spread. Before we can prevent it, we have to understand what we're dealing with. So these are the CDC recommendations for the U.S. community facilities with confirmed cases, and they had um, a document about how it spreads. So the most common form is from person to person, mostly among close contacts. We can, we'll talk a little bit about whether it's six feet or longer coming up. And this type of uh, transmission occurs via respiratory droplets, so it's really in the air. And aerosolized particles may stay in the air for up to hours. We also know that ventilated patients, patients on CPAP and BiPAP, have increased in aerosolized particles, they're higher risk. Um, we even have people, when, when we jump to the community, people coming in from the outside, urgently to the cath lab, we know that 25% of the people who are transmitting may be asymptomatic. Even those that eventually develop symptoms may shed the virus for one to three days prior to, to uh, symptoms. And uh, there's some even evidence that suggests that the virus may remain viable for hours on surface of materials. So let's look at some of the details. This is an article recently published in the New England Journal that, that did some different testing. So they looked at aerosolized particles and they found that they may last for up to three hours. Now, one of the criticisms of this article is that they really aggressively aerosolized them. They had a, a real aggressive mechanism. So it may not translate directly to what we see, um, but these particles can last. And then they looked at different surfaces and how long they could last. Um, this is kind of the order they go, copper, cardboard, stainless steel, plastic. So it lasts the longest on plastic and stainless steel. Uh, that can last for up to 72 hours. Uh, the cardboard made me a little nervous. I do worry like if I order a takeout pizza that it's going to be on the pizza box. So something to consider. Um, when we talk about aerosolized particles, this is a, a diagram of someone sneezing. There are different size particles and really this is divided into large and small, but there's a whole range in between. The large particles probably contain more virus, but they tend to drop off more quickly. The smaller particles can go for a, di a different distance. And things that increase those, coughing, sneezing, singing, talking loud, really increase your particle distribution. And if you look at some of the data on what we find, we can find coughing produces a, a jet that can go 68 centimeters from the patient. If you do the same cough with a surgical mask, it reduces that to about 30 centimeters and an N95 to about 15 millimeters, or 15 centimeters, sorry. So this is a, a key I think everybody knows, but I'll just repeat it. Wearing a mask does not really prevent air leakage between the mask and the skin. And with a surgical mask, you still distribute about almost 30 centimeters and with an N95, about 15. Then if you move on to look at the right lower portion of this diagram, this is a, a group out of uh, Alto University that modeled what the, the um, particle spread would be for a cough, and then they were modeling a grocery aisle. Um, the basic concept is that you develop this cloud of particles, and they distribute a distance, and they stay in the air for a little while. So you have to understand that's the mode of transmission, and how do we prevent that when we get to the cath lab. This is a study that looked at um, different um, uh, ways to provide oxygen support, and then the, the dispersion of particles in the air. So if you look at this, you can see the nasal cannula at five liters was up to about 100 centimeters, and then as expected, less oxygen, it would go down. Four liters was only 40. Many masks was better. Non-rebreather was actually pretty good. And CPAP, kind of the key is if your mask fits well, you're not going to have a problem. Nasal pillows, not very good with CPAP. And then if you look at a leaky, leaky face mask, you know, quite a, quite a good distance. But if you have a tight face mask, does pretty well. So then the next series of questions, okay, so patients come into the cath lab, who should we treat as COVID positive? Well, should we treat everyone as COVID positive? Well, that'd be safe, but it's not really practical. Um, and so we really can't do that at this point. I think it depends a little bit on your population at risk, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's going on in Minnesota coming up, so you kinda of know your outpatient population. We are lucky, we have uh, partnered with the Mayo Clinic and we have the rapid testing we just heard about. Uh, we have about a 45 minute test, so we can wait uh, that period of time if the patient is stable. 
If they have a STEMI or hemodynamically unstable, we treat as COVID positive. Um, and if general, if, the stable, if they're COVID and they're stable, we wait until the disease is treated or they get better before we do any invasive testing. And of course, we should follow, there's a guidance document that came out from Sky ACC that uh, I think is gonna be discussed later in the, in the talk, but that's really how, how we should follow that guidance document for how we treat our patients. This is what's going on in Minnesota right now. You probably have similar things in your state. Um, testing, we've had about 70,000 tests, about 5,000 were positive or 7.3%. Deaths were 343 and our total cases recurring hospitalization about 1,000. And you can see split into hospitalized as of today and then ICU. Uh, the point of this is really that everything is going up, right? So this is as of two days ago. And we can see we, we're, all we know right now is that we're going up we don't know where the peak is going to be. Everyone's seen these, these models where we look at the demand and what the peak is going to be and how to predict your ICU beds and ventilators. And we've gone through an extensive internal process to try and do that. We've made um, three other areas ICU with negative pressure rooms. Um, in Minnesota, it turns out our prediction is the peak is going to be somewhere between the mid and end of June, and then it should stagger off, and then it looks at different strategies. What I can say about the models is I think all of them are wrong, but they give you a general idea that it's gonna get worse and then get better and social distancing probably helps. I think this is an important, um, important diagram. Uh, this looks at healthcare workers and how many healthcare workers uh, tested positive. So in Minnesota, we've had about a thousand and they looked at where they got their exposure. So really, if you look, there's only about 8% that are really getting them from the hospital. So we're doing a really a pretty good job with the PPEs and most of them are getting from other areas, travel, community contact, or, or actually living in some, some places where there's a high concentration. Okay, so let's move on now. Now that we understand a little bit about the demographics and the, and the spread, let's talk about cath lab and what do we need to focus on. And um, I'm gonna talk just about the COVID positive or presumed positive patient that we're treating. And really the focus I think is on the safety of the staff and the, the physicians, uh, if our staff gets sick, they're a relatively scarce resource. We lose our cath lab staff, it's hard for us to operate. So I'm gonna talk about the components. I think there's a patient prep component, room readiness, how you do your PPEs, how you clean the rooms, and then some special considerations. So preparation for the cath lab. We are putting all patients in a who come to the lab in a surgical mask. Um, cloth, cloth masks are ineffective. We said, no, we're not using those. Um, this was a study that was done in Europe and it looks like the masks don't do very much. And again, the surgical masks do, do not prevent uh, spread from the person wearing the infection, but decrease the risk of spreading to others. And the other thing we talk about is patients with significant re respiratory failure, but not yet intubated. We try and intubate those electively prior to coming to the cath lab. We know there's a very high aerosolization of particles when people are being intubated, they're coughing, they're, they're doing it, it's not well protected, the airway's not protected. The intubation should be done by anesthesia because they're probably the best at it in a controlled setting, hopefully in the ICU. And as we all know, urgent or emergent intubation in the cath lab can be quite hectic and more difficult to contain the particles. So the next phase is really the room readiness. We designated one room to be our COVID room. I would encourage everybody to do the same. We label the doors so there can be no mistakes so the transport people don't actually take a patient into the room. The room should have negative pressure and the negative pressure rooms require a minimum of 12 air exchanges per hour. Um, our room does about double that. We're about 24 air exchanges an hour, so it's a pretty good room. Um, I would encourage you to talk to your maintenance people or facilities management people to find out. If you don't have a good air exchange, you can add a HEPA filter to the room. We did that for a while while we were testing the room and that, that pulls particles out um, while you're doing the case. We considered choosing a room that can handle both coronary and peripheral cases. So we chose our medium size II so we could do both. Then we removed all non-essential supplies. So normally we store catheters in the room, everything else. We removed it all the outside because if you're cleaning, um, you'll have to clean everything. And even closets, they help a little bit, but doors need to be open, so we try to move everything out. The room should have an anteroom with a door to the lab and a door to the outside. 
So let me jump to the next slide. This is a diagram of kind of what a room looks like. So here's your, this is a hybrid OR, but you can see here's your, here's your II and, and patient table. You should have door from hallways, preferably two doors, but one is okay. But what you really need is this anteroom. So you have a door, when we have a door between the, the cath lab room and the anteroom, sometimes it's your control room, and then we have another door to the outside. What this does is it adds a step so you're not exposing directly to the outside. Now, negative pressure should help that, pull particle in, but we've taken this as an extra step. So what we do is we have a runner who stays in this room and then brings supplies in from the outside so we're not going directly out. So what do we need for a cath lab team? A minimum four person, we have a nurse, x-ray or scrub tech, CV monitor tech, and then we talked about the runner in the inner room. We limit room to essential personnel only, so we don't have people coming and going unless they really need to. We try not to change the teams out until the case is over. We do need to consider extra staff though. Uh, if you have someone in the ventilator, you might need a respiratory therapist. If you have a balloon pump, Impella or ECMO, you need extra people. And then, you know, if you have a code, then you need people to help come do CPR. So you need to think about that when you're getting your extra um, equipment ready. So what do we need for protection? This is a, the guidelines. Um, you need to have respiratory protection, eye protection, body protection, and gloves. So basically everything protected. Um, which mask should you wear? So there's a little debate going on whether you should use a P, uh, N95 or actually a PAPR. So um, this is the respiratory filter. So N95 means that you filter out 95% of all particles with a diameter greater than 0.3 microns. Um, the US has N category 95 and 99. European system really has a F, or FFP1, 2, and 3, which is about 80, 94, and 99. So the F, FFP2 is equivalent to an N95. So we have some recommendations on which mask you should wear. The World, World, the World Health Organization suggests wearing a surgical mask in any aerosolized generating procedures. Both the uh, European Centers for Disease Prevention and uh, Italian Health Department suggest N95 or FFP2. Um, the, the WHO suggests a medical mask instead of an FFP2 for aerosolized procedures. Um, We've chose to go with PAPRs, so powered air purifying respirators. Why do we make that decision? The PAPRs reduce the aerosol concentration to at least 1 25th of that of air compared to 1 10th with N95s. So we wanna provide the best protection that we can to, our, to our, ourselves and our staff. So um, the PAPR uses a battery powered fan that connects to the hood that basically is positive pressure. Um, they use HE filters, which have a greater efficiency than the N95s. They're, they're maybe easier to breathe through. You have a little more room. You have air coming in. You feel cool when you wear them. So it's maybe a little bit more comfortable when you're doing the case. The downside, they're high cost. There is some contamination during undressing, which we're going to talk about. They're loud. We've gone to headsets. I tried my first case without it. We couldn't communicate. And the batteries have to be recharged or replaced. So we found early we needed to really pay attention to the batteries. So if your PAPA runs out, if your battery runs out and you're in the room, you've got no protection, you have your surgical mask, so it's not very good. Our batteries last about eight hours. We replace them after about six hours. We have 24 access to fully replace batteries. And after each case, we plug them in. So we always try and keep them fresh for use. You need to really have enough of the, of the PAPAs available uh, to meet the room demands. And we consider at least seven. So that's for our team of three and then other people that you may need. We wear a regular face mask under the PAPR and we have these headsets uh, which are available and are really good, especially communicating to that runner in the anteroom. Okay, so here is the process you go to put them on. So before entering the room, you remove all your items, usual watches, jewelry, and secure your hair. So um, people with longer hair, pull their hair back so it's out of their face. First step, you do hand hygiene. Then you put on a surgical face mask, your regular mask, then a headset, and then your PAPR. Uh, the PAPR usually requires uh, assistance from the runner. You put it on and then you have to connect, connect to the, uh, the hose to the back, and that usually requires some help. Then you go in the room, you put on your sterile gown, sterile gloves like you always do. After you're done with the procedure, remove your gown, gloves, and then proceed to the anteroom. room. First thing you do is you hand hygiene as soon as you get there. 
Then you disconnect the hose at the top. And again, this is where your runner really helps. They should wear gloves. When you take your hood off, reach up to the top of your head, pull the gown in the back, pull it down, and don't touch the front of the papper. That's generally where the highest particle concentration is. Um, then the next thing you do, once you have that, you set it on the table, perform hand hygiene, and then you put on new gloves. Then with your gloves, you disinfect the papper, um, and you have to hit every spot on the papper, allow it to dry two to three minutes, and then you hang it up in a sterile place, uh, 15 to 20 minute dry time. Then you remove your gloves, put them in the trash, and then you do hand hygiene again um, with your standard technique. I included the CDC recommendations for PAPR cleaning. I'm not gonna go over them, but I included them in the presentation. If you wanna go in great detail about how to do it, here's the CDC recommendations. Okay, now you're out of the room, then you have to consider room cleaning. So if it's an aerosolized procedure, you have to wait at least 15 minutes. The doors have to remain closed. No one should go in another room. What's happening is the negative pressure is cleaning the air out or your HEPA filter if you need it. Um, if there's no aerosoling sizing procedure, you can begin right away. And then we do what's called a terminately cleaned under enhanced droplet precautions. So we do thorough, we focus on all surfaces, we wipe down everything, all in and garbage is removed, and it takes 15 to 20 minutes, what they say. Uh, I think it's more like 30 minutes and they have to let everything dry, so there's a little time period. It's probably more like 45 minutes by the time you're done with one case before you can do another case, even if you're working very quickly. And then I'm gonna finish with some special considerations. So what if there's a second emergency? So you have one COVID room, your room isn't cleaned. And like I said, that can take up to an hour. We actually had that happen. So we have a second room that's set up. Um, ideally, you'd have peppers in that room too. Um, it's expensive to have those. Our backup, we consider N95s and face shields if we really get in a pinch. Um, and uh, we also can consider using a terminal clean in that room, maybe even with the UV light, which is pretty effective for that room if, you're not, if it's your regular patients that aren't COVID positive. And like I said, if you run out of pampers, you can go with an N95 and face shield, they're pretty good, but I think not as good. It's 1 10th versus 1 25th of the particles that are filtered out. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna say finish with a thank you and show a cool picture of the virus and hopefully we can eliminate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff, uh, for that uh, incredibly uh, uh, detailed uh, presentation. Uh, lots of uh, pros there. There is one question um, uh, is about the use of pepper. Uh, one of the hospitals uh, administration would not uh, make pepper available for the cat lab. Uh, they are saying that the CDC guidelines does not require the use of pepper in the cat lab. Is there a uh, uh, substantial uh, uh, guidance regarding this? You know, the, the, the guidance really comes from the studies that show it removes more particles. You are correct that the CDC does recommend N95s and a face shield. I think part of that is based on resources. There's really been no study comparing, comparing the two to see which is better. We elected to go with the safest. It's a little more hassle. Um, but it's safer, so that's what we elected to go to. And I would encourage whoever to push their administration, at least for the cath lab, um, who have these um, you know, hectic times, have high particle burden at times, to have the best protection. There is a question from Dr. Arun Kumar. Uh, Paneer Selam is an interventional cardiologist in India. Uh, I hope uh, he and his family are safe out there. Uh, does HEPA air purifier in outpatient cardiology consultation room useful? Um, I think it is. So um, if you can afford it, it's expensive, but the, the, we have the big industrial HEPA filter and that's what we had in our rooms. It really does decrease your particle count. So if someone is infected, it can decrease your particle count. It's like a, a way of, in a sense, generating negative pressure without having a negative pressure room. There is another question from Dr. Muhammad Al Talavi from Egypt uh, for you as well as Sandeep. Uh, do you recommend radial or femoral approach considering distance from patient's face uh, in the cat lab? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we haven't really um, uh, thought about that much, but you know what I like, I, I have tend to move to the femoral approach because I put the, the lead shield up in front of me. So I really feel like I have an additional barrier to particles. 
So if you look at every uh, place now, they're using plexiglass to prevent the spread. I look at it as my lead shield, as my plexiglass. So I have tend to move to the femoral. Now you can do the same thing with radial. They're not too far apart. I'd be interested in Sandeep's uh, uh, thoughts. Yeah, you know, I, I'm sure I'm going to get some grief from my fellow radialists about this, but uh, I do more or less the same thing, Jeff. That was a fantastic presentation, by the way. I think, you know, both for this, and I'm going to touch upon this uh, in my presentation, you know, staying as far away from uh, yeah, the source of the aerosol uh, is probably uh, probably in everybody's best yeah, interest. Yeah, I'm going to ask the delicious question. Yeah, I agree. Further away is better. Barrier, any barrier you can put up is better. So Jeff, it's, it's, it's Brian Cluck. Uh, you, you know, great talk. Um, we found, uh, we, we don't have pappers. We, we use N95 and, uh, and shields, but uh, we found some other things uh, are really important to emphasize. Number one is that when the patient comes in the room, the door is closed immediately afterwards so that don't, you don't get your hallway uh, uh, yeah. contaminated. Uh, and, and having a, a um, uh, debriefing after each and every case to remind the staff uh, of the, the points where you may have uh, sort of broken the, the chain so that you can improve each and every time. That's really good advice. Um, uh, there's that one question regarding testing for a Chris, uh, same question being asked by a couple uh, different people. Dr. Ballard is a vascular surgeon in uh, New York. Uh, uh, what is the recommendation uh, for testing prior to starting elective surgery and which test uh, should be performed? Um, so what we are actually currently trying to do at Vanderbilt is make sure that they come in 24 to 48 hours before surgery and they are screened for it. We are using um, our lab developed test if they are able to come in earlier and we have more time. So the turnaround time for that is four to six hours. Um, if for some reason the patient presented and is ready for, for surgery and did not make it 24 to 48 hours before that procedure, we are doing the rapid test and we're using the gene expert for that, the Cepheid gene expert because of accuracy. Um, we did have one patient yesterday, actually, this is interesting. She presented to the ED and had a heart attack there. And so we had to take her to the cardiac cath lab and we did use the gene expert on her. Uh, we, we feel a little bit more comfortable with that technology only because of the high uh, sensitivity rate on, on that assay. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to uh, move forward. Uh, it's now my uh, great uh, privilege to have uh, Dr. Mandeep Mehra, who is um, William Harvey uh, Professor of uh, Medicine uh, at uh, Brigham and Women uh, Advanced Cardiovascular Medicine. He's also Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Uh, he's very involved in multiple publications related to COVID. Uh, and uh, he is now going to discuss uh, tackling the stages of COVID-19 illness, use of existing and future uh, pharmacotherapies. Mandeep, uh, thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Raj, thanks, uh, thanks uh, a lot. And uh, frankly, I must thank you because I've uh, been learning quite a bit. Uh, there are so many nuances of the virus uh, nor the uh, viral testing that I was uh, unfamiliar with to a certain extent, and I'm very grateful uh, for the thoughtful way in which you've put this together. Uh, is my screen uh, visible to everyone? Yes, we can see perfect. Wonderful, wonderful. And my voice is carrying through okay without any Sounds background great. noise. Sounds yeah. Great. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks again, uh, uh, Raj, and uh, I'll, I'll take the prerogative of uh, perhaps um, uh, reconciling for everyone on this call, uh, the fact that uh, COVID-19 is not a respiratory illness. Um, I will also make a provocative statement that um, uh, COVID-19 is not um, caused by a respiratory virus. It's in fact caused by a vasculotropic virus. And I'll try and share with you some insights as to why I believe this to be absolutely true. Uh, it, just to be um, uh, more provocative, I will say that the SARS-CoV-2 virus enters the body as a respiratory pathogen 
but it's really a cardiovascular virus and that we all in the cardiovascular community have an extremely important role to play as we think through this uh, particular clinical syndrome. Now, in the early throes of um, COVID-19, um, my fellow Dr. Siddiqui and I proposed the staging system for um, COVID-19. And we, we basically uh, put the proposition forward that while the initial early infection stage, which 80% of people shed, is, uh, is a viral um, uh, replication phase, that most of the deaths that are occurring with this and most of the severe illness that occurs is less responsive to the viral phase and much, much more responsive to perhaps an aberrant host uh, uh, responsive phase. And initially we thought that this phase was purely a hyperinflammatory response where an aberrant in inflammatory system or a um, immune dysregulation was responsible uh, for causing this uh, almost bipartisan phenomenon that we were seeing through the pulmonary phase into this uh, late uh, stages of hyperinflammation. But now I think that uh, my construct in the last few weeks has uh, changed significantly, where I think that one of the key things that we need to focus on is to determine the exact role of endothelial cell dysfunction. And we know that when um, oxidative stress, or we know that when uh, viral engagement occurs, there is diffuse endothelial cell inflammation in this syndrome, and I'll show you evidence of that. And if you were to just simply think about uh, this disease as a vascular disease, many of the protein manifestations that are uniquely and curiously being proposed in this, such as strokes in early folks, um, COVID dose, all sorts of uh, um, systemic things that are coming to surface, it actually may make sense to think of these as a vascular phenomena due to endothelial cell dysfunction. Because if you think of the candidacy of the endothelium, you realize that it actually does all of the things that we are observing with COVID-19 when it's dysfunctional, such as thrombosis, inflammation, vasoconstriction or vasorelaxation, and uh, increased propensity for cardiovascular events. Now, evidence that this is in fact true was provided in a, uh, a, a publication in The Lancet about 10 days ago on April 20th by colleagues from University of Zurich that I had the privilege of working with um, when I had posed this issue to them that perhaps uh, COVID-19 is a endothelial cell disease and they quickly came back and said, you know what, seems that it's correct. And, and what we were able to show, if you look at panel A here, is you can in fact see a endothelial cell in which you can see the coronavirus inclusion bodies. Now, uh, now some will argue, well, um, is it really coronavirus? Um, uh, what is it? You didn't actually stain for coronavirus. No, it, uh, it looks and smells like the coronavirus. And this was the only disease in this autopsy specimen. Uh, this was not an in vivo specimen. This was a post uh, vivo specimen, as, as, as you can imagine. And uh, one has to posit this patient died of COVID-19 and therefore this evidence of virus in the um, endothelial cell is quite striking. The second uh, observation we had in this data was that when you look at other organs, this is actually bowel uh, and this is uh, lung. And when you look at these uh, uh, diffuse organ systems, not only do you see recruitment of inflammatory cells, but when you apply capsase 3 staining, uh, which is uh, really a, a measure of apoptosis, uh, which again is a measure of endothelial cell dysfunction, you in fact can notice that across the body, there is evidence of endothelial cell dysfunction apoptosis of endothelial cell bodies, and a diffuse endotheliolitis, suggesting that this terminal syndrome may in fact be a vascular element, one, because of direct viral engagement, but two, because of indirect um, inflama uh, in inflammatory uh, syndrome-based engagement of the vasculature. Now, why would the 
um, endothelium be so prone to be engaged? Of course, if you think about it, we have three protective uh, covers on our uh, body. We have the skin that protects us from the environment. We have epithelial cell and mucosal cell linings in the throat and the nasopharynx and the lungs through which this virus gains easy entry. And then of course we have the vasculature and endothelial cell lining that protects the entire internal system. We know that uh, this virus uh, comes in by using its spike protein on the ACE2 receptor. And if this is in fact the predominant way in which this uh, virus enters the human uh, body, then it may be intuitive to try and ask the question, uh, well, this is a virus that engages the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and therefore where else and with what level of expression do we find ACE2 receptors in the human body? And that's shown uh, on the right. And you notice uh, this is a log transformed uh, sort of uh, graphic presentation that shows you the ubiquitous nature of ACE2 receptor expression throughout various tissues in the human body, suggesting that this virus is, uh, again, unlikely to just be a respiratory virus but is in fact a systemic virus that can engage multiple organs. And it perhaps does so through its uh, systematic way of engaging the ACE2 receptor throughout. Now, when we start to examine some of the early data from Wuhan, where they systematically measured biomarkers, there are some interesting um, uh, observations that uh, one can make. The first is that um, very early on in the disease process, uh, one starts to see within a week or so, uh, D-dimer elevation, suggesting that either this is post-inflammation stimulated, or this is perhaps representing a uh, increase in thrombin generation in the body. But um, uh, one would have to position this as a very curious entity. So if you look at other inflammatory syndromes, let's say a ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, uh, and, and you start to measure D-dimers in those patients, it's not very common to see hyper elevation of D-dimers in those patients. It's not a very common finding. In these patients, it's very common to see hyper elevation of D-dimers early in the course. We also begin to see inflammatory markers uh, start to rise early in the syndrome. We see lymphopenia, of course, uh, that occurs in this uh, syndrome uh, early on. And uh, one of the earliest inflammatory markers, which is known to all of us as an acute phase reactant, is serum ferritin. And this is elevated early on in the course of the disease. What is elevated a little later in the course of the disease is depicted here in panel E and that's cardiac troponin. So you notice that a lot of the pro-thrombotic, pro-inflammatory, acute phase reactant type biomarkers are elevated right before we start to see evidence of cardiac injury, which uh, appears uh, slightly later in the course by approximately three to four days late than these other biomarkers. So it stands to reason to think of this as a very structured uh, process of, um, um, of a pathophysiology that begins with perhaps vascular engagement, begins with vascular cell dysfunction at the level of the endothelium, begins with expression of some of the abnormalities of thrombosis of pro-inflammatory cascade um, and immune dysregulation, and then uh, the cardiac injury once that layer is uh, disturbed. Now, there has been early data looking at cardiac MRI in COVID-19. This is a uh, um, single case uh, paper that uh, the group from University of Zurich and I published together just recently. And in this, uh, it was very curious. This was a patient who came in with COVID-19 who basically started to manifest signs of uh, hyperinflammation and also had a troponin elevation. And so what we decided to do was to send this patient down for a cardiac MRI because a point of care echocardiogram was completely interpreted as normal in this particular case. We said, this is kind of strange. Why is the troponin elevated and all um, clinical signs um, uh, not suggesting any evidence of cardiac injury? And so we went down and did an MRI on the patient and quite clearly there was no late gadolinium enhancement. But when we did the MRI, it became very evident to us that this entire 
uh, myocardium was highly edematous, very, very um, edematous and perhaps inflamed or showing evidence of endothelial cell dysfunction, which then led to the leakage uh, syndrome. And when we looked at uh, the MRI in detail, there was clear evidence of myocardial injury in terms of T1 and T2 mapping of this uh, cardiac MRI visual signals. There have been uh, only sparse pathological findings presented, but one of the most curious pathological findings that have been presented, and this is data from a single uh, autopsy case from Italy uh, by Carsana and colleagues. And here they show in the lung, uh, obviously recruitment of inflammatory cells, uh, CD68 positive cells are macrophages, CD45 cells are lymphocytes. They also showed viral inclusion bodies within the lung uh, parenchyma here and the alveolus uh, and the type two pneumocytes. But what was curious here, here is that they showed this organizing microthrombosis in the, um, in the capillaries of the lungs and suggesting to us that this elevated D dimer may not just be a pro-inflammatory reaction, but may in fact be a signaling that thrombin is activated throughout these cells and perhaps secondarily uh, indicating to us that there is significant endothelial cell dysfunction, even in this uh, respiratory phase of the disease. There have been other uh, case series presented, which curiously have shown that, um, uh, that there is not the typical cardiac injury pattern that we see with myocarditis. So we don't actually see a predominant lymphocytic um, uh, infiltrate in the heart what we end up seeing is more edema and more injury, almost akin to the loss of that protective layer, the endothelial cell layer, which then allows, the, it allows leakage syndromes to occur. And uh, very similar to an ARDS-like pattern of capillary leak syndrome that we see in the lung. So if you were to summarize what these various cardiovascular complications are, Yes, we see acute cardiac injury in about one in five patients by around day seven to day 10 of the syndrome. Uh, there is, of course, the, present, uh, uh, the presence of heart failure and cardiogenic shock in a few patients. Uh, arrhythmias have been curiously noted, and as I'll share with you, uh, an underlying history of cardiac arrhythmias is uh, predisposing uh, us also to increased uh, death from uh, this particular uh, syndrome of COVID-19. And this theoretic risk of venous thromboembolism is uh, quite real because people are now sharing data with us that uh, a quarter of the time they see deep vein thrombosis in this syndrome. And when you really ask the questions, does, does the patient with COVID-19 die of the virus or does the patient with COVID-19 also die of cardiovascular events? And it turns out that coagulopathy, acute cardiac injury, and heart failure are quite central in uh, determining death rates, which uh, points out that uh, simply focusing on uh, antivirals or simply focusing on pure inflammation without attention on the heart is unwise in this syndrome because a third of all the deaths in this syndrome are cardiac in nature, as um, the early data has shown. Now, there are a variety of mechanisms for cardiac engagement and involvement. Uh, certainly direct viral toxicity could occur, but it's not very common. Uh, there is cardiac microvascular disease, which we believe to be a significant uh, component of endothelial cell dysfunction. Of course, the hypoxia from the respiratory phase of the illness uh, can itself induce myocardial injury. And there is uh, the exacerbation of subclinical stiff heart syndrome. So you can think about it. People say, you know what? The elderly are much more predisposed to death from COVID-19. Why? Because they're older? No, because many of them have stiff hearts to begin with. We may not have diagnosed uh, diastolic heart failure, or we may not have diagnosed uh, HFPEF in those patients. But uh, in the presence of the, this insult, a stiff heart syndrome could get worse if it starts to develop edema. And we have, uh, of course, a Takotsubo-like catecholamine-driven dysfunction that can occur in critical illness. And then there's the more traditional inflammatory response cardiomyopathy. So we observe this in cancer chemotherapy with CAR-T uh, therapy, 
where there is a, or with immune checkpoint inhibitors, where there is a massive, massive uh, immune recruitment and hyperinflammation that can cause a cardiomyopathy, which if you just give it enough time, uh, uh, once it calms down and you treat that hyperinflammation phase, it gets better. Now, um, I'd like to rapidly share with you a few uh, data that have been emerging in this syndrome that is curious and again points out to the vascular nature of this disease. Uh, the group from New York uh, City, from NYU, Sripal Bangalore and others uh, published a case series in a research letter in the NEJM just recently with 18 patients who presented with ST segment elevation MI. And what they've basically found was that not all of them presented like a, a traditional myocardial infarction with obstructive disease, and many of them had non-obstructive disease. Uh, but curiously, all 18 of these patients had elevated D-dimer levels in the hyper-elevation uh, phase, multiple fold uh, elevations, which is not a common phenomenon seen with ST-segment elevation MI. And then uh, a group just uh, presented another research letter in, in the New England um, that showed from Sinai, from Mount Sinai, that over a two-week period, they noticed five young patients who showed up with um, um, a large vessel ischemic strokes. And all five of them tested positive for COVID-19. And when they compared and said, what is the ambient rate of stroke presentation at our center in patients with this age group and this type? It was less than one person uh, every two weeks um, in this age group before. So there may be almost a five-fold increased predilection uh, somehow to um, uh, these vascular events that are occurring uh, with, um, with COVID-19. Again, a very curious issue. So the theory that I'd like to set for you before I end in a few moments is that the infection, in fact, disrupts three pathways in the human body. It causes ROS dysregulation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It causes an endotheliolitis and it causes immune activation. And the concerted uh, effect of these three pathways that are activated is uh, to create oxidative stress, uh, completely dis, uh, dysregulate the coagulation cascade and result in inflammation, which then results in the effector organ function and the shock and death that we see in those that die from COVID-19. So uh, quite quickly, uh, uh, you know, when you think about this, uh, it, it stands to reason that you may in fact use uh, antiviral therapy early in this stage, but if you apply the antiviral therapy too late in the course, it's unlikely to be effective. And you may have to think of anti-inflammatory agents, and there are many trials ongoing. I'm leading a trial with a granulocyte macrophage CSF inhibitor called uh, gemcilumab now uh, to look at uh, COVID-19 outcomes. Um, uh, this uh, GMCSF inhibition uh, is uh, slightly more upstream uh, when you compare that to IL-6 uh, blockade, for instance, an IL-6 blockade, which is being advocated with the use of drugs like uh, serilumab or tocilizumab, um, uh, it, it, I'm not so sure that it will yield a very large benefit, largely because it is a bit too downstream and too specific and leaves the other cytokines uninterrupted. And so uh, one needs an upstream um, uh, blockade of the immune system. And in concert with that, uh, if you use a uh, antiviral agent, perhaps vascular protective drugs like statins and ACE inhibitors, for instance, may play an important role, or perhaps colchicine, which in the COLCAP trial um, uh, from Jean-Claude Tardif has been shown to have some uh, uh, benefit post myocardial infarction. And in fact, he is doing a COVID-19 trial as we speak, and we uh, look forward to the anticipated outcome of that. So these uh, potential therapeutic candidates certainly deserve a little bit of discussion before I end. Uh, statins, for instance, are a fairly safe uh, group of uh, drugs. And uh, is this really an unusual candidate or if, the, of, or if COVID-19 is a vascular disease, is it actually a staple uh, diet candidate uh, from a standpoint? There has, of course, been this uh, revolving um, uh, controversy of whether ACE inhibitors or ARBs should be stopped or continued. Um, of course, um, I believe that the controversy has now been fairly reasonably resolved to a large extent. 
from some observational data that uh, we've, uh, we and others have presented just yesterday in the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'll share that with you. So this was a paper right hot off the press. So we uh, looked at uh, nearly 9,000 patients uh, in an observational registry from three continents, uh, Asia, Europe, and North America. And uh, we, these are independent predictors, and we were able to confirm the independent um, uh, risk of death in COVID-19 with age. We were able to confirm that uh, female uh, gender is clearly protective in these patients. And we were able to confirm without uh, much of a doubt that individual components of cardiovascular disease, such as coronary heart disease, heart failure, ar arrhythmia, are clearly, clearly deleterious in determining death, and independently so, independent of the medications. When we examined the medications, uh, there were some uh, reassuring findings. First, we uh, concluded that either ACE inhibitors or ARBs did not cause any harm in this syndrome. Uh, that's reassuring. So you don't need to run around stopping these medications. But curiously, what we actually saw was uh, rather than uh, just not causing harm, ACE inhibitors and statins appeared to tilt uh, the uh, signal towards a beneficial signal. Now, I will caution you that data like this um, is uh, purely observational and unmeasured confounders cannot always be assessed in this. Uh, we did uh, dissect this data in some detail using uh, multiple avenues of um, statistical configurations. And this, uh, this signal stayed in this database. And if it is true, it deserves to be tested and deserves to be tested rapidly because it goes along with this uh, vascular hypothesis that I have been proposing to you. So let me end now by uh, pointing out to you that I think that effective therapy against COVID-19 uh, is not just an antiviral. It will require a multifaceted approach and that this pathophysiology of critical illness is related to a direct viral insult that begins it. But it's a misdirected and uncontrolled immune response that then causes multiple organ injury, underlying which, in my opinion, is a vascular dysfunction and diffuse endotheliolitis that causes death in these patients. So I'd like to just thank Raj and the Academy for uh, the opportunity to speak to you on this weekend. And I'll end by showing you this um, uh, self-portrait of Edward Munch, uh, who's a Norwegian painter. Uh, you'll notice the date is about a year after the Spanish flu uh, in 1918. And he was actually a victim of it. And it shows so clearly what we are going through, the social uh, distancing, the, uh, the self-isolation, uh, the frailty, as well as the sadness and the depression that we're all going through. And I only hope uh, that we can all uh, work together to overcome this uh, very interesting time. So Raj uh, and uh, uh, the, the wonderful audience, thank you for your uh, uh, time. Thank you for listening to me. And uh, I'm uh, open to any comments or questions that you may have. Thank you, uh, Mandeep, uh, for the very insightful a superb presentation. Uh, we only have time for one quick question uh, from uh, uh, Philippe uh, Albuquerque. Uh, I, if I'm a healthcare worker in the front line, should I start taking statin? <laughs> well, uh, what, what I will say to you is that if you have a underlying indication for a statin, uh, not related to COVID-19, then you must and if, if uh, you know, I, I may add that you should try to use uh, reasonably high doses of it. There is no data uh, that suggests that uh, statin use is prophylactic for COVID-19. What our data suggests is that if you are admitted to the hospital with COVID-19, and our registry was restricted to that, uh, that, um, uh, that this, in fact, um, at that point, uh, those who have been on a statin seem to have a survival benefit. So it may make sense. My take right now is uh, that if you do not have an existing indication for statin, we need to do a clinical trial uh, to test this hypothesis. But if you do have an uh, existing indication for a statin, um, it would be uh, less than uh, ideal to not be on a statin at this time point. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of the time, uh, uh, I know that uh, Dr. Omar Latif, who is the CEO of Rush University Medical Center, uh, is uh, waiting. Uh, he has an important meeting, but uh, uh, I'd like to just take a couple moments uh, to introduce him. 
Uh, he has done uh, uh, some seminal uh, work in uh, healthcare quality. Uh, he has been a leader um, in, the, in the field, uh, has been a professor of pulmonary and critical care uh, medicine, as well as has been uh, associate uh, uh, chief medical officer and then chief medical officer, as well as uh, dean of medical sciences at Rush University prior to uh, becoming a CEO of um, uh, uh, Rush University at the current time. So he, he, without further ado, uh, I'm going to have him uh, discuss um, the um, <clears throat> decision making in critically ill uh, COVID-19 patients, key principles of therapy. Thank you. I'm um, just loading it up right now. Great. Thanks so much for uh, uh, waiting patiently. No, it's my pleasure. Um, let me see. I'm having trouble with my slides here, but I think it's uh, sharing. Can you guys see slides or no? Uh, I do not uh, see them just yet. Let me uh, try to do this. No. Right. At the bottom of the thing, I was seeing your slides earlier. So uh, there's a share screen uh, button if you press that. Yeah. All right. Why don't you jump to the next person and I'll restart these slides. I apologize. That's that's okay. We can wait a second. Okay. You know, yeah, you just give me two seconds. Yeah. Just take your time. Yeah. Yeah. So Mandeep, there is one more uh, question uh, from Dr. Ashwini Sood is about role of hydroxychloroquine and prophylaxis in uh, healthcare yeah. workers. Um, you know, um, I shied away from that because I actually have a paper in review, not on healthcare workers, but on the hydroxychloroquine chloroquine issue in hospitalized patients from the same registry. We've now looked at this data in 96,000 patients. Um, and uh, what I can tell you is that what we saw was not reassuring. I would strongly, strongly not recommend uh, using uh, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine analogs at this time point. Um, please be on the lookout for that data. It's in active review at a um, uh, big journal. Dr. Susanta Pradhan's uh, uh, question is, uh, should, we, should we be changing ARB to ACE inhibitors? Yeah. We don't, we, we don't, yeah, it's a great question. We don't know the answer to that. You know, observational data like this does not point to that. But frankly, if I had a choice, um, I would definitely switch for those that can tolerate it. Right. Um, Dr. Arun Kumar um, has asked the question. Uh, okay, now we can see Omar's slides. Okay, we'll- um, Sorry we'll, about that. We'll that. Thank you very much. We can Thank see you. your slides, perfect. Yeah. All right, so I will, uh, I will get us um, relatively back on schedule because uh, I'll stay true to the, the, the time because I know so many of you have so much uh, phenomenal information to share and I learned so much from those and what I would really regard as incredible presentations. Um, I'm gonna present this uh, a little differently. I, I think I'm gonna talk more about how, to, how we prepared and, and what the preparation thoughts were around specific treatments and treatment goals that were found uh, to be effective. And I think what I, I really enjoyed from the panelists so far was at the end of the day, we really get to the concept of supportive care once people get critically ill. And I think there's, there's the different phases of treatment that we all talk about. And when we talk about those phases of treatment, we tend to focus on what medicine is this giant change agent. And it's certainly going to be in phases and history is going to show us that uh, months and years from now, that if you, if you aggressively treat early, you may not get to the point where you need hospitalization. What I'm going to focus on is what happens at the point of hospitalization and build off of some of the presentations from this morning. No one's probably ever seen this picture. This is a, 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 a graph that's never been shared, but I'm going to present it a little differently. I would say that we look at this, this graph that um, eight weeks ago I had never seen, and I think it, there doesn't go an hour without somebody, even a family member, sending it to me by text message to ask me if I've seen this. And the reason this is an interesting graph is while it certainly shows the, the desire for the entire world to stay under healthcare resources, I think you have to factor that differently for the different type of healthcare system you are. So for example, um, you may, healthcare resources may mean a bed, may mean staff, and may mean supplies, 
or it may mean the number of ECMO circuits to the number of patients you have. So it's not just ventilators or the number of respiratory therapists you have and the ability to prone people. So really when you look at, at what you're talking about healthcare capacity, this has to be structured for the goal of the institution and the type of patients and the city and the environment that you're in. So it's, it's, I think what's misleading about this is we tend to look at this and we look at big numbers of how many positives do we have and how many negatives do we have. We don't necessarily look at this and say, well, how many people in our heart team can come in and start ECMO? How many circuits do we have? Or how many of that, that particular staff do we have? And I think that that's an important trend to consider when you look at some of the different types of hospital systems in the various large cities. If you go six weeks ago um, to the Hopkins website and, and you see this just phenomenal graph, you looked and you saw the United States had 14,000 cases. There was about a quarter million cases and there was discussion all over the country and in each state about how there were different levels or perceptions of understanding. One of the things that was pretty much agreed on um, that if you looked at the experience and you would be foolish not to, to learn from scholars all over the world, to learn from scholars in Asia and to learn from scholars in Europe and to understand that if you didn't decrease the social interactions between infected patients, then you would have an increase in spread of the disease. After that point, there was a lot of talk and a lot of a, this mix of politics and healthcare where the, there was talk on whether or not one should social distance and does that conflict with how we, we are as a country and it just it got really political. But for the most part, every expert agreed that you should try to stay away from large groups of people. So we said as a country, that's what we were gonna do in the United States. And so this is a picture of the airport after many of the national scholars in the country uh, has suggested that we really practice social distancing. And this is a picture from O'Hare on March 14th after the president of the United States issued an order to tell all, all Americans traveling outside to really try to get back home. And these are people that came in from Asia, Italy, Europe, all different parts of Europe, all different hotspots, and they were stuck in this queue for what was reported in some newspaper articles as hours, three, four hours. And if you look at each one of these people and you, you consider the presentation um, by interventional cardiology about how to protect you in a cath lab, these are high risk people. These are, these are travelers coming from endemic areas. And if you just sort of put your, your cursor on any one person and draw a six foot wave around them, they're really impacted by around 10 different people. And so that, that doesn't bode well. And you have the same picture certainly in Louisiana for Mardi Gras that went on. And these are the pictures of beaches in Florida. So this is, this is three weeks ago. This is what happened. Uh, you saw what was just uh, spot points of red in the United States of America and massive red in Asia to really a change and almost like an imp a transposition. Where, and, and there's some hope here because you start to see the red in Asia decrease. Um, and then there's some pessimism here because you see a massive amount of red increase in North America. And that's, that, that was a concern. And that's the, the reality of where we were. And then you fast forward to today, the United States doesn't like um, being passed by anybody. And certainly that, that rings true when it comes to COVID-19, where there's over a million cases in the United States. New York, if you make New York a country, um, it's fifth in the overall death toll, um, which, which really puts a perspective of the rapidity of the spread of the disease and, and, and some of the realities of, of what we were dealing with. And so I mentioned early in the presentation that really, um, uh, I mentioned early in the presentation that, that it's important to learn from places that had this disease. And, and I live in Chicago and Chicago had the, the uh, unfortunate advantage of, of seeing other cities go through this first. And it would be foolish to pretend that one could just need to reinvent the wheel. And as countries, some countries were successful in mitigating this and, and keeping the areas under the curve and pushing the limit on, limit on heroic therapies, there were other countries, nations, cities, and states that were not able to do that. And when you really reach out and look across uh, the, the United States of America, we were sitting in Chicago before our first case came and said, well, how can we prepare so that we can offer the type of care we wanted to offer? So we... We reached out to those, those leaders in New York and Seattle and said, if you can do things differently, knowing what you know now, what would you do? And we built an infrastructure for that. And we also asked, really, what therapy would you offer? What are the key things that you have to have available for every patient? And those we grouped in sort of the lessons learned. 
So that said, um, someone uh, spoke earlier and I thought it was a, a great statement about models and, and models are great because they're so academic and there's so many different groups of people that like compete against how fascinating their models are. And I think that's important. And I think the models are good because they do truly tell trajectories. But the models that an individual healthcare institution uses should really be laser focused on the type of care that institution wants to deliver. So for example, our institution is an academic medical center in Chicago and we would like to offer prony. So our model should try to portend what the number is of patients that are gonna need prony and how many respiratory therapists we would need. The most of the models that were released just looked at the ventilator number and that raw number may not be helpful in really understanding what you need to have. So we, along with some others working with the University of Chicago and the Booth School, um, created a, a sort of a calculator that allows you to put in your data and then get out of that data what number of beds you would need, what number of masks you would need, what number of gloves you would need or whatnot. But we made it focused on what number of ECMO circuits we would need or what number of transfers were coming in. So when you really look at the volume of confirmed cases, that's the data that drives this engine. And then that was really a function of the city and states were telling us how many ICU beds we needed. But nobody was telling us how many circuits we would need to provide ECMO, or nobody would tell us how many respiratory therapists we would need or predict how many respira respiratory therapists would get exposed and leave, and how would we prone people. So we had to build that modeling into the institution that, that we had. And, and we, again, learned this approach from really phenomenal people in Seattle and New York who were at a front line that's unlike anything that, that, that I've ever seen in the United States. And certainly they had talked to people in, in other countries in the world to learn from sort of their experiences as well. And the question we asked is if you can go backwards and figure out what would you do different, what would it look like? And this was sort of what they told us to prepare for. Are you gonna take transfers? If you're gonna take transfers, how are you gonna care for them? What are the therapies you're gonna do? coordinate those therapies with other hospitals, work as a city, not as an individual hospital, and see if you can, see if you can get different outcomes. And so we um, had the benefit of copying off of sort of what I would call great leaders in the country. The driver for our data, the driver for every calculator has to be raw numbers. And so these are the raw numbers that our city, just like every city in the United States puts out and every state puts out, and they, they provide trends and some of the trends are good and some of the trends are bad. And there's a, a lot of super intelligent infectious disease scholars all over the world and epidemiologists telling you what to do with these numbers. In reality, it's just all scary to me. I'm a very simple person. Um, many of you realize most pulmonologists try to get into cardiology. We just don't admit it that often. Uh, but uh, you know, when I look at this simply, I just see high lines here. And when I see high lines, it shows you a high number of infected people. And I'll just tell you point blank, as our testing doubled in our state, our positivity doubled and our doubling rate went down. You want a higher doubling rate. You want there to be slower spread. However, in talking to our partner hospitals, which we do get along fairly well in the city of Chicago, we really did learn that our ad admissions were tailored off or decreasing despite the increasing numbers. That really tells us that with increased testing, we were revealing more positives, but you can't fake shortness of breath. So if your ICU numbers are not going up with or without testing, you should have a good feeling that you're flattening the curve and starting to move in the right direction. That's really where we started to feel like we could interpret this data. We could look at our trends and look at our calculators and say, we should start to get ready for that next phase. I mentioned earlier that you should tailor the specific therapies that you wanna do with the data, that you should have data driving the therapies that you wanna provide. And so in our medical center, we, we really, we enjoy doing, we, we along with many of your other hospitals, felt that there was a lot of positive data and good outcomes using ECMO, using proning, and then certainly we wanna offer clinical trials. And like many other hospitals, we had to build the infrastructure to do this and do this rapidly. You know, ECMO has always been controversial in single lung injury. Um, it's, every pulmonologist loves it, but it, uh, because it's like, it's like crack to an ICU doctor, it keeps everybody alive and it gives you time to figure out what's wrong. So if an overdose comes in on a Tuesday night and you don't know what it is, your first answer is, hey, do we think about ECMO? And then there's like seven phone calls where people yell at one another and then you end up, you know, giving them an antidote and they get better. But the reality is, ECMO and single lung disease or single organ failure has had pretty impressive results 
in select anecdotal trials and larger numbers of trials as we're starting to see. So uh, we wanted to do this. And so while all the data looked at how many events do you have, there was really no way to model what would the numbers be if you were gonna provide ECMO. We took about 100 transfers, uh, actually we took over 100 transfers in the last 45 days and the overwhelming request for transfers were this patient's optimized on event. They've been given whatever antiviral therapy, they've been given some trials and they were really transferred for that reason, for ECMO. And so we, we've had some good results. We've had one death and 14 patients in total on it, three decannulations and nine extubations. So people are still on ECMO. We had an opera singer who got extubated. He's on ECMO and he's singing. That was huge for the environment. Um, it made people sort of recharge the environment we have. Proning has been a big deal for us in our organization. I don't know. Uh, I suspect it's the same for everybody else. When you prone an intubated patient, the, the ability to expose your population is pretty profound. ET tubes fall out. Um, respiratory droplets are splurring out all over the area. And so it's really just become something that every institution has learned a lot more about how to do it efficiently. It's not like there's a single handbook on how to prone. There's many, and there's many different philosophies. To safely do it, you need three to four people in a room. You have to watch all your drips. You have to watch your ET tube. The press doesn't do a good job of differentiating proning for vented patients, for non-vented patients. And these are the challenges that we've had here in the organization. And clinical trials. Clinical trials have been an issue. And it's simply, if you look at the vast number of clinical trials that have been unleashed into the environment and the intense pressure on every hospital to offer them, it takes a huge number of coordinators, data scientists, data mapping and coordination with the city and state as you do this. And you really wanna kind of do it in an organized way. So not every hospital is doing the same six clinical trials. It would almost make sense if you shared them. And we didn't have that infrastructure in our city. And, most of the cities, in the, as far as I know, no cities in the United States had that infrastructure to say, all right, we'll do these two trials, you do these two trials, and this other institutional, these two trials. But imagine if we can do that. And I'll get to a little bit of what I talk about in a moment. Situational and treatment awareness. Look, this is just, you know, the reality of, of Illinois. We had close to 60,000 positive patients and 2,500 deaths. Our hospital, we, we have, uh, you know, a 25% positive rate of people we're testing. Um, of 5,000 confirmed cases. Today, this morning, we have 240 admitted patients. And the reason this is an impressive slide for us as an organization of uh, impressive being something that creates a lot of anxiety and stress in the organization, 108 are in, in the ICU. And um, we have a medical ICU, which is 28 beds that we normally run. So these are 108 ICU medical patients. And so that just means all these various ICUs and surge units that were created like in all of your hospitals, have really sick patients in it, COVID positive, intubated, prone patients. Um, and uh, it's a, the reality of what we're faced with and what we're dealing with right now, which is again, under the curve. I would say that the, the city of the state of Illinois has managed to stay under the curve because in large part of learning from the experiences of other states and being more draconian in their measures. The change, this is one of the, the interesting realities, and I know this is an international audience. I don't wanna assume that every, every country is like the United States, and I don't wanna assume every hospital is like my hospital, but change is pretty hard. If we go up to an ICU and say, hey, we're gonna change this ICU from a cardiac to a medical ICU because we need more beds, and, we, and there's not an international pandemic, that's a one-year process. That involves talking to ACGME, talking to all the program directors, talking to all the different nursing staffs and all the healthcare providers and, and key people. And then even after that, you still don't get it done. At many hospitals in this entire country and world had to make three years of changes in three weeks, reorganizing structure, rechanging the entire structure to enhance physical capacity, staffing capacity, buy more equipment and supplies and optimize in-house capacity. The optimizing in-house capacity is really one of the most frustrating realities and it gets to what some of the other speakers mentioned today. We reduced elective office visits and stopped all surgeries and all non-COVID transfers and all turned our hospitals and healthcare infrastructures in COVID hospitals. And that scared people. That's why some of the data coming out of your organization shows that 25% of people with chest pain are staying at home instead of coming to the hospital. They think of the hospital as a COVID hospital. So the drivers of standard care really die down. And so if you think about the holes that are created when you make massive changes to hospitals that are used to moving slow, they're substantial. 
So every time you make change in an organization, you increase the likelihood for error. So we're very concerned as all my partner hospitals are about increasing risk, exposures, and things like that. So we did what we did. We took our, our areas, we made makeshift ERs, we took single rooms like all of you and made double rooms. We took post-op areas and, and when we made surge capacity, and this was when we had literally less than a thousand cases in the state. And so we did this because this is what other countries said to do, to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And not only did we do this, I can tell you, and, and, and testing. Um, testing became the all powerful conversation in every place you went to. Everybody had to figure out ways to do drive-through testing. Everybody had to do walk-in clinics. And, and as we ramped that up, we can tell you that the city and state did as well. And this is an amazing thing. And I'm, I'm positive that many of you at some point in your career have attended conferences in the McCormick Center. This picture here to the left, I took with my camera the day before opening. And this picture to the left is where you would go in and those beautiful pharmaceutical and device companies set up all their equipment and you kind of walk through with your ID and got all your gifts. It was filled with tents. The picture to the right shows piped in oxygen. They had the ability in these tents to do high flow oxygen. They had the ability to do what many of the step down units in the most prestigious hospitals in America couldn't do. And they stood this up in two weeks. So it was stunning. And when you took a step back and that's, that's what it is. And I would tell you right now, it got a high. And when you look at those tents, it got as high as 12 patients. That's how many patients went into the McCormick Center. And that's a good thing. I think the argument was to be over-prepared and see what would happen because you certainly didn't want to be in a situation where we wouldn't be ready for an onslaught of patients. There were impacts and challenges that have happened to our, to our healthcare system and to our hospital. And, and they, they were unique to COVID and they're, they're, not unique to, uh, they're not unique to any one hospital, but they are unique to COVID. We had to manage fear and prove our environment is safe at a daily unprecedented amount. Historically, and, and many of you um, uh, may have lived through other sort of trying circumstances in healthcare and look back 10, 20, and 30 years. And there was a time where uh, a healthcare provider sent out a guideline and it wasn't questioned. Um, that time certainly isn't today. You know, every guideline that comes up is under scrutiny on Twitter, is under scrutiny on, on social media, and you have to defend that. And so you could say we're following the CDC recommendations and then someone show you a picture uh, of a person who was infected anywhere in the world and say, I'm not coming to work until you do this, this, or this. And so the challenges were managing fear and really proving that the environment was safe. There were exposures, mass exposures of healthcare workers earlier on in the disease. There's certainly continued to happening, but we learned, like we always learn how to do better at this. Um, personal protective equipment has been an ongoing, non-scientific, bloody battle in the, the, to the extent that there are people refusing to work, there are organizations refusing to allow their workers to come to work because they felt like the personal protective equipment was inadequate, despite whatever science was proven around that. There's a financial imbalance that was mentioned earlier, which when you say we have the largest pandemic in our lifetime and uh, hospitals are gonna hemorrhage and lose money. And that's the reality of, of where we are. And then there was a new reality of city and state coordination and, and field hospitals and how they interact with individual hospitals and how hospitals aren't coordinated. So really what, what a pandemic shows is the secular nature, or the isolation and silos of each healthcare structure in America. And so it would, how amazing would it be if in each one of your cities, you shared all the resources and came up with ways to utilize each institution as if you were a floor of a larger hospital that was a city or state. And that's really, unfortunately, what we realized. We learned it in watching some of these other cities come together. We tried to do that, but it, it was so, certainly challenging. And the reason I would say field hospital were challenging is you've seen the data where a, a whole functional hospital that was a boat ended up on the shores of New York. And while there was carnage in New York with hospitals with 900 beds taking care of 1,500 COVID positive patients, there were six patients that were managed to be accepted to the boat. So that lack of coordination is something that got highlighted by this epidemic. So how do you handle this? You try to communicate, you opt the thing. So we sent out a survey and, and this is a lesson learned for being a, a new and, and novice. And as you can tell already, I'm not a very intelligent um, CEO. And I would tell you that we sent out a survey saying, you know, how are we doing? What are you learning? And the things that we got back had nothing to do with PPE, ECMO morbidity and mortality, survival of proning. 
the most uh, the, the most common things that were referred to was thank you for offering a daycare for our employees. Thanks for working to get us a hotel. Thanks for uh, covering Ubers. So, you know, all this work that was done wasn't necessarily the work that was translated to 13,000 employees. All the work that was done to surge has to be unsurged, and there is no roadmap for that. The same way there was no roadmap to surging, no hospital has a roadmap to how do you unsurge. And there's so much political fear in how you do this, everybody says we're going to get around this by testing. I mentioned political fear because no politician wants to say go back, resume elective surgeries and get business back to normal only for another surge to come out. So they say, don't worry, we're gonna test. And once we test, we're gonna solve every problem. I really enjoyed the presentations on testing today. I can say that we struggle every day around this testing issue internally. And then antibody testing came out. So we were under an intense amount of scrutiny and pressure to do antibody testing. So we're doing it now. And we've had hundreds of people sign up. We know every single employee wants it, but we don't know what the positive or negative antibodies mean. So the, the, the brochure we're giving to people when they're walking out after getting their antibody test results, like three and a half pages long. But anybody who's antibody positive, you certainly hear them celebrate. They feel like they're immortal. We're not sure if that's gonna turn out to be true, but the reality is the key to reopening is going to be testing and it's going to be algorithms and people much smarter than us in administration are gonna drive those algorithms to tell us what's safe and what's not safe. The impact of this is staggering, and I would be remiss to leave this subject without mentioning the impact. There's opportunities that came out with this, and the opportunities I mentioned earlier to share and not compete, to coordinate data, to open source it so that we can learn from what's happened. And we shouldn't have to make a phone call to New York and say, are you finding that proning works? The faster we can get this data out in real-time databases, the better it is. Meetings like you're having this morning where you're sharing information across the world about what we're doing in our cath lab doesn't have to be evidence-based through the rigor of a trial because we're in a unique time and circumstance. But knowing that patients that had a BMI over 45 just didn't do well with proning helps us a lot not trying to prone those people. Unfortunately, we don't have that communication in those free-flowing data right now from Seattle to New York, from New York to us. We have informal channels and groups trying to organize it. We don't have a central repository that everybody can share that's open sourced and fair. This is an opportunity for us to build moving forward as a nation so that we can enhance our care. We have seen some insurance changes around what telehealth is. In telehealth, we see patients love this. I've heard many of you before the conference reference how telehealth was something that you're getting used to. Patients love this. If they don't have to come to the hospital, it's a reality. We see federal funding pop up in, in ways that are unprecedented. But there's challenges is how do we cover and how do we, how do we recover? And when I say this, the engine in this country that drives the revenue of hospitals is elective surgery. It's not taking care of COVID. And not everybody understands that. Certainly the media doesn't understand that. They see full hospitals and think you're doing well. I can just tell you that I know of hospitals that are losing 50, 60, 70 million dollars a month in operating margin and taking care of COVID, doing everything that they can possibly do. So it just doesn't seem like we have an alignment of our healthcare structure with our financial challenges. The last thing I'll reference is a second surge. One of the big realities here is all the work we're doing is responsive. We have the opportunity now as a world to learn from the first surge to learn from the data that's there to say, what do we do for this second surge? When fall comes, how do we prepare? It's not the time to argue against scientific people and to challenge Dr. Fauci's credentials. It seems like the time, in my opinion, to be humble and let the virus tell us what to do, but be as safe as we possibly can. So that if we had field hospitals that had 12 patients, maybe that's okay and shouldn't be the fodder for popular media. Some final thoughts on what the US is seeing today. This is the greatest pandemic to reach the US since the Spanish flu of 102 years ago. It's the greatest economic contraction since the Great Depression 80 years ago, and it's the largest central bank and government intervention of all time. This is just what we're in right now. And so here's what feels wrong. The cover of the Wall Street, the Wall Street Journal had an article where it talked about potentially between 1,100 and 1,800 hospitals going out of business during a pandemic. I can't wrap my head around this as a as a humanist and as a person that looks to the world and try to understand how can people 
volunteering in unprecedented amounts, coming to work in harm's way, have jeopardy for losing their job? And why should other doctors that may not be able to help at the front line feel guilty or somehow take a pay cut when the reality is when the world gets back to normal and people need to catch up, they're going to work two or three times as hard. We have to figure out how to fix that. And why are people yelling at healthcare workers, accusing them of closing the nation? How are scholars for the last 30 and 40 years having to defend logic and science for the first time? So that feels wrong, but here's what feels right. And this I've seen, and we've all seen all over the world, healthcare workers fighting to volunteer at unprecedented amounts, people calling each of our hospitals, trying to get to New York City, trying to get to Seattle, trying to get to Wuhan to say, what can I do to help? Trying to get to Italy. That is something that is a field and as a, as a practice, we should take an incredible amount of pride on. And what also feels right is as a nation, we are gonna have to reevaluate our healthcare structure. We have the technology to save lives that would be lost. That technology are things like ECMO, are things like proning, are things like heroic therapies. But if we, if we overwhelm resources and can't use that, then shame on us. So if we can figure out how to reorganize our healthcare structure to take advantage of the knowledge all of you bring every day, the knowledge all of you bring to sort of benefit from that, we can only move forward as a country. And so I really wanted to lay out some of the challenges that are more systematic rather than talk about you know, how to turn a ventilator on for ARDS. That's pretty straightforward. You know, the, At the end of the day, treatment is supportive care. It's supportive care in clinical trials and learning from what's happening. And history is gonna look back on this moment now. How we respond to what we learn, I think is gonna define healthcare of our future. So thank you for your time. I, uh, I really appreciate it. I know I went about three minutes over and I'll, I'll defer to you for uh, questions if you have any. Thank you, uh, Dr. Latif, for that uh, fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, we'll take a couple questions. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Tanvi Rath from Emory University. If you need urgent intubation in the room, how far should you move away? Yeah, so I, you know, look, it's the same thing as um, I, I would I would reference the exact same sort of presentation. Around. So any respiratory producing procedure, droplet producing procedure, aerosolizing producing procedure, it's not about how far you should move away. You should be wearing an N95 mask at that point in time. So, you know, if you're there, you're there. And so there, there's not a distance in that room where you're safe if it's an aer aerosolizing, I can't say that word. It's very complicated. It's a, it's, it's a cardiologist word. So um, uh, I would say that you should be wearing the right PPE. So there is no safe distance in that setting because you're in the room. Got it. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for taking the time out of your very busy schedule. I know you have a lot going on. Uh, and, well, it's really and an honor. So you. thank you all, thank Dr. You. David. Thank you. Um, so um, I will continue to uh, move the session forward. Uh, and now it's my uh, privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Jennifer Pisano, uh, who is a uh, specialist in infectious disease and currently a medical director of the antimicrobial stewardship program at University of uh, Chicago. And she uh, has one of the most important presentation today on update on candidate therapies for COVID-19. Welcome, John Jennifer. Thank you. And let me just make sure I can share this. We can see your slides just fine. Can you? Okay. Yeah. Let me get it to the slide. We can hear you well as well. Wonderful. Looks great. Okay. So thank you again for the opportunity to come and talk today about um, candidate therapies for COVID-19. Um, I'll plan on just giving a broad overview and certainly I'm not going to be able to um, touch every candidate therapy out there. As you know, in the very beginning, all approved, um, all approved drugs were, drug candidates were screened. And I feel like there's just been a host of trials and um, different therapies that could be used. Um, but many that have started to be used with very little um, clinical data. Now, much of the approach to treating COVID-19 disease is informed by the two phases of infection, 
Stage one or early infection shows a very high viral load in the beginning of illness that decreases over time, while stage two starts at about eight to 10 days and is the start of the host inflammatory phase response. Now this is where the inf inflammatory, um, the immune system ramps up and we get a lot of the clinical picture that we are now used to associating with COVID-19 disease. Shortness of breath, abnormal chest imaging, um, elevated inflammatory markers, and at times progressing to a hyperinflammation phase or ARDS. I, mean, I think this really, I, the, the way that we've looked at using therapies for COVID-19, I think is going to be a, um, a paradigm that we might be using for other infections in the past. I know we've all um, known, you know, we've all known patients with other viruses who seem to do very well versus others where they just get this huge inflammatory response and it's really the inflammation that drives how well they do clinically or not. And it's really the future, in my, in my opinion, of infectious disease and being able to find the, the um, balance in treating the virus or treating the infection, as well as um, finding just the right amount of inflammation um, to treat it, but not go too far and really wreak ha havoc on the body. So now we'll take a look at a couple antiviral agents. I'll start out with lopinavir, ritonavir. Um, we'll talk about remdesivir and um, favipiravir. Um, talk a little bit about immune system targeting agents and then um, convalescent serum. But again, there are many others, um, but this is what we'll focus on today in the 10 minutes. Now I wanted to talk about lopinavir ritonavir because it was really the first, um, the first antiviral agent that when looking at um, the history of um, uh, candidate um, drugs for SARS that was supported by in vitro data animal models for SARS and MERS and thought might have a um, benefit for, um, for COVID-19 as well. It's a protease inhibitor. Um, it comes in an oral solution and tablets um, and adverse drug effects are GI upset and increased LFTs. And I think the earliest data that we had um, and in our discussions with our colleagues in Singapore when trying to wrap our brains around what we were going to be using um, when, um, like Dr. Latif was saying, when, when COVID came here, we, we really tried to learn from our friends in Wuhan and our friends in Singapore. Um, and they initially had some very promising data on lopinavir, ritonavir, with or without ribavirin. Although in more recent data um, is really failing to show a benefit of, um, of lopinavir ritonavir. So this was a recent randomized control open label study looking at 99 patients with lopinavir ritonavir versus 100 patients with standard of care. And the primary endpoint was the time to clinical improvement. They did not see a statistically significant difference in time to clinical improvement or mortality benefit with lopinavir ritonavir. Um, side effects occurred in about 50% of the treatment group and about 13% of these um, they had to have therapy stopped. So after this trial, and I think with, uh, as well as the increased availability of remdesivir, um, lopinavir ritonavir kind of took a backseat and, and in many, um, many institutions, at least that we talked to, um, stopped using it all together. Um, you know, I, I, it, the way drugs have been used for um, COVID-19, it really makes you reflect on, you know, using drugs because you really want, you, you have therapies, you really want to use them, you want to make a difference versus really using them only within clinical trials so we can actually learn learn from their use and you know i think we're going to look back and see um on how we did with covid 19 and in many cases i think we're going to wish we were a little bit more particular about the drugs we were using in one so moving on to let's see here so moving on to remdesivir so remdesivir has been the most promising of all of the antiviral agents that we've had for COVID-19. It's a novel nucleotide analog and inhibits the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. 
and it has activity versus SARS-CoV-2 in vitro, SARS and MERS-CoV in vitro, and in animal studies. There is only an IV formulation at this time, and adverse effects include nausea, vomiting, increased AST, ALT. Um, there is a concern for renal impairment sec secondary to the cyclodextrin vehicle in the IV solution. This is the same cyclodextrin vehicle that's in like IV voriconazole. Um, so that you, that you might be more familiar with using and being concerned about the renal impairment. Um, and this is why on the inclusion criteria for the remdesivir studies, um, renal insufficiency is on the is in the exclusion criteria for that. Now this week we had a very exciting um, uh, report um, from an adaptive trial that's been that's been going on um, looking at remdesivir and it showed that patients who received remdesivir had a 31 percent faster time to recovery than those who received placebo um, with the, and there was a trend um, towards the survival benefit and the mortality rate of eight percent versus 11.6 percent for the um, placebo group This is on the heels of the compassionate use from Desevere um, data being reported that um, showed up over 60% of people had a benefit. But again, this is um, compassionate plea um, and it's not a placebo controlled trial. Um, soon after the adaptive trial data was, um, was released, um, Gilead did release um, their own some of their own information from their ongoing studies showing that um, initial data showed that the, there was sim similar efficacy with five days and 10 days um, of durations of remdesivir. They're also looking at different doses of remdesivir. So the 200 times one and then 100 um, daily for five to 10 days versus um, 400 as a load and then 200 milligrams daily. So if there's anything that COVID has shown us, it's that there's always a positive and a negative or a yin and a yang with any of these studies. So almost the same day that, um, that the, the NIAD data came out um, showing that remdesivir, um, showing the benefits of remdesivir, this study was released um, based on some Chinese data um, showing that there was not a time to, um, there was no significant mortality benefit or time to clinical improvement in patients in which they used remdesivir. This was a randomized controlled trial, double blind, placebo controlled multi-center at 10 hospitals in Hubei, China. Um, hospitalized adults um, were started on therapy within 12 days of symptom onset. Um, and these were all adults with O2 sats less than 94% in room air and changes on chest imaging. The primary clinical out endpoint was the time to clinical improvement within 28 days after randomization. This it's a little bit um, difficult really to kind of know what this study means because it was discontinued because of control. They said because of control of the outbreak. So they only ended up enrolling about half the patients that they were going to. Um, it was initially going to be powered at about 80% and they were supposed to enroll about 435 patients and they only ended up enrolling half. So again, I think it's really difficult looking at the remdesivir data that we have, the early data, and this one, it's really difficult to, um, to know what the study means. But they did um, in their conclusions they did say that there might have been a five-day reduction in time to clinical improvement if treated within 10 days of symptom onset. And I think this within um, days of symptom onset is a very, um, it's going to become more and more important um, as we go on, especially when we're looking at the antiviral therapies in the first stage of illness, is how quickly that, it, that it, therapy is started. Now, I just have one slide on Fevipiravir. Um, it's also an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase um, inhibitor. 
And there's known activity in vitro against all saltamivir resistant influenza viruses. Um, and it was initially approved for use in Japan in 2014. The adverse drug effects are increased transaminases, GI discomfort, and elevated ser um, serum uric acid. And initial reports show a decreased time to viral clearance in patients using this drug versus placebo in the initial press report. However, um, I think time will tell um, how, it go, uh, how, um, how it does, especially with the successes of um, remdesivir. And there are ongoing studies um, in, that are going to be starting up or maybe ongoing right now in the United States. So not going to spend too much time on hydroxychloroquine, and I very much look forward to Dr. Mayer's paper that will be coming out because this, I think, has been um, been the root of a lot of controversy in the in the treatment world. Um, initially, in the beginning of February, when we first started talking about hydroxychloroquine, we were very excited because it could have potentially um, treat the virus in two ways a potential antiviral effect um, interfering with the binding of the virus to the ACE2 re receptor inhibitor, as well as maybe with its longer half-life and time to build level, um, have effects on imi the immune system modulation component as well. Um, it was reported to inhibit, chloroquine was reported to inhibit um, SARS-CoV-2 in vitro um, and hydroxychloroquine it does that a, a little bit more strongly. Um, and initially, it's an anti-malarial drug, uh, drug used in rheumatoid arthritis. The adverse effects, um, there's growing concerns for cardiotoxicity, especially with QT prolongation, um, retinal toxicity with long-term use, um, and hepatic abnormalities, as well as rash, and this has a long half-life as well. Um, the FDA did um, release a um, caution against the, the use of um, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine um, for COVID-19 outside the hospital setting or um, as part of a clinical trial. So, you know, I think we'll, there's more to come on hydroxychloroquine. I, again, I think we're all looking for, um, forward to more data, but this has been one of the more controversial ones, especially with this um, study that was released initially with 20 patients and then with 80 from France, where they did report um, decreased amounts of viral carriage at day six compared to controls um, with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Um, the, the journal that, um, that did um, end up publishing it um, did kind of, re, you know, go back and say that um, that there were, they agree there were some concerns with, um, with this trial, just looking at the inclusion criteria, um, the way the PCR um, data was run, um, as well as some other issues. Um, the, the, the trial that we've been looking at the most and had, um, that really kind of took hydroxychloroquine off of our um, standard algorithms when choosing therapy for, um, for our hospitalized COVID-19 patients was this trial out of the VA um, that came out just a couple weeks ago. It was, this is a retrospective analysis of, um, of 368 patients in the VA system. They looked at patients getting hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin or no hydroxychloroquine slash just standard of care and looked at the primary outcomes of death and mechanical ventilation. We found that the rates of death in the hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin and no hydroxychloroquine groups were 20, 27%, 22%, and 11% um, respectively, and made the conclusion that no evidence, um, that the trial could not provide any evidence that the use of hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin reduced the risk of mechanical ventilation in hospitalized patients with COVID. So again, um, this was um, there, another trial showing no benefit. Um, there's been a lot of safety signals with um, potential cardiac toxicity, especially when combined with other QT prolonging agents um, and just underscores um, the potential risk of use um, with maybe not um, as much benefit. Now the last um, group I will be talking about here are um, immune system modulators. So these are the inhibitors of cytokine release syndrome. 
So the two, um, the agents that we've been most focused on are IL-6 receptor inhibitors, so tocilizumab, but there are other um, agents that are being looked at, IL-1 and IL-17 receptor inhibitors, um, inhibitors in the complement system, really anything along the, the pathway of cytokine release um, can be affected in this. So tocilizumab is a monoclonal antibody that binds to both soluble and membrane-bound IL-6 receptor um, and inhibits um, IL-6-mediated cytokine storm. The usual uses were treat the treatment of inflammatory rheumatologic conditions, um, as well as CRS after CAR T-cell therapy. It has a long half-life of 16 days. Um, adverse effects are neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. And it really came into play after biomarkers were first found in China to have extreme, have much that, um, that patients who had severe and complicated COVID-19 also had much higher levels of IL-6. Um, and it was correlated with adverse outcomes. I think right now, our institution, as well as many institutions across um, the country and the world are still trying to Kind of learn as we go and, and we um, learn from our patients how, what are the appropriate criteria to start tocilizumab in patients using um, inflammatory markers as well as clinical criteria. And again, there just isn't a lot of data to support um, the use yet. There was, um, this is just a, syst a systematic review that was done and it's two retrospective reviews and a couple case reports. Um, one of the systematic reviews is the first one that came out of China in, in early February um, that um, looks at just about 20 patients um, who did better after getting tocilizumab. But again, they were also getting a lot of other therapies. So it was hard to say if it was the tocilizumab um, or anything else, which is frankly the case with a lot of these, um, these preliminary looks at um, at medications for COVID-19. So the conclusion here is, you know, there's an option for compassionate use, but more data is needed as part of clinical trials. And right now we do have um, a TOSI versus placebo trial up, and there are many other institutional-based trials as well. Um, there will also be a remdesivir plus um, um, tocilizumab trial, I understand, coming out as well. The last, um, the last therapy I'll talk about is convalescent um, serum treatment. Now, this is the passive antibody transfer from a patient who's recovered from COVID-19 disease, and that can be given to exposed um, people or as part of therapy. And again, small um, observational data studies. This is kind of the biggest one and the most cited is, nine, is um, five patients who were critically ill um, with COVID-19 and ARDS, all had received antivirals and methylprednisolone. Um, four of the patients were on mechanical ventilation and ECMO, um, and after getting the um, serum treatment, um, no longer needed the support by nine days post-transfusion. IgG and IgM levels were maintained at seven days. Um, of course, with any of these treatments, the potential adverse effects are transfusion-related reactions, allergy, and hemolysis. They did see significant, um, well, they did see decreases in viral load um, in the SOFA score, increases in PaO2, and decreases in body temperature after, after the therapy. So the take-home points, I think, are that we just really, really need more data. Um, you know, all of these therapies you should consider strongly um, if you're considering any COVID-19 therapy that if you should use it outside of a clinical trial or at least as part of a structured institutional approach that can be, um, I think, studied and then reported more broadly. We're all learning from each other and everybody's approach is kind of adapting based on, uh, um, based on the information at hand. Um, you know, we, we've kind of lived in this world now of preprints and it's been really interesting. At first, I was really excited about the preprint world because you get you know, information very quickly. And now um, it's, it's been a little scary sometimes as things get retracted. So we'll just have to see how that goes. I think the initial data on remdesivir, in my opinion, is very promising. I'd love to hear about optimal duration, doses, when to initiate, alternative dosing strategies, and still much more to come on tocilizumab as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jennifer, for uh, that very insightful presentation.
Uh, we'll have a time for just a couple questions. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Fahad Raja from Egypt. Uh, once recovered from COVID, can patient be reinfected? So that is a great question. I think that um, we don't know now. So the, the antibody tests, they, just, they will show us that um, the presence or absence of antibody, but they don't necessarily tell us if somebody is immune. Um, there have been reports out of South Korea about people getting infected, although I have not reinfected, but I haven't seen the primary data because we've learned more and more how long people will shed the virus. So I haven't seen, um, I haven't seen enough of the report in the literature to say that it's not just the one syndrome with prolonged shedding, but that it was one, someone got ill, they got better, and then got ill again with COVID-19. So I hope you, you won't get reinfected. Um, the initial data with the antibodies and how we expect them to stick around it's not like uh, antibodies for measles or mumps where you'll have them for life. They, they suspect it's more like for flu where you're going to need a, vi a vaccine every year. I know we have experts on this um, webinar who can probably delve in more deeply to that. But I know the answer, the answer to can you get reinfected is I hope not, but I don't know at this point. Uh, there is a, one, more, uh, one more question from a, a physician. Uh, who had COVID himself. Uh, he was taking uh, azithromycin on his own uh, once he was diagnosed. And once his symptoms beginning to start getting worse, he took hydroxychloroquine and he felt uh, uh, immensely better and was able to recover uh, just fine. So his question is that, uh, you know, that there's been some negative statements today about hydroxychloroquine. Mm -hmm. Is it something that is not being started early enough to be effective? I think that's a really good question. Um, and I, and I really think that some of there's a lot of the, 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 the drugs right now, they still probably have a place. We just don't know where or even at what dose or what patient population, because we've really just started them for swaths of people across the board without really targeting specific groups. Um, a lot of the antivirals we suspect, well, I suspect might be more helpful very early on um, as the viral loads are the highest, even in the pre-symptomatic um, phases. So, so yeah, no, they might be better earlier um, or even for prophylaxis. Jennifer, yeah, a great talk. It seems like um, we have so many patients with this, but we have lack of studies. Like everyone should be in a registry. We should have registries trying to look at um, who, do the antibodies convey immunity? What are the best drugs? What should we do? When do we start and what are the doses? We have such an opportunity now. How do we organize as a medical community and really start these trials? We're not really seeing that from the national level, but how do we do a groundswell where we can get something like that going? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I know that. So I, I do transplant ID and I know there's been, um, there's been a, in our community circles, um, there's been registries of solid organ transplant right. patients right. and the different and that are updated every week. And yeah. we, have, we have the TAVR registry, same thing. Everybody gets a TAVR is in the registry. No, that's fantastic. Um, so I think there needs to be more of that, um, that happening. Um, again, just more, the clinical trials, you know, it is disappointing a little bit with remdesivir. Like, I'm glad that we found, um, I'm glad that we've, we've got some good data, but we probably will never know more about placebo controlled or what the standard of care is, you know, with it, because everyone was doing all of these things. It's always versus standard of care, but really standard of care was Kalitra, you know, other people get methylprednisolone and so it's really hard, but I, I like the registry idea. I think we need to be more um, intentional about, about that for our patients. I'll look forward to see your registry next week. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a quick, I have a quick question, Jen. Um, now that we've got antibody testing, uh, does it make sense to serially test people who have demonstrated certain levels of antibodies to understand the offset? 
to understand the offset. I'm not sure what I understand. Well, to, to, you know, th there's all this speculation about what level of antibody is a clinically meaningful level of antibody, right? And so to just sort of understand, uh, especially in patients who have a clearly identified time course, they can identify when they had their symptoms, when they had their clinical syndrome, and now they have antibodies uh, because, you know, as we go into potentially the, the second phase of this and the third phase, you know, that might be useful information. I, I, don't, I don't know, I, you know, in a resource constrained environment, I don't know if we can do that, but it seems like that would be useful information. Yeah, no, we have a couple of researchers at U of C who are going to be doing um, exactly those kind of studies where they follow people serially, although they don't have their qualitative, not quantitative. So we won't be able to get the antibody titers, which, you know, at, now, you know, until the next assay comes out. Um, but yeah, and they're, they're hoping to follow forward and kind of track and then look for reinfections later on. But again, that's, those kind of studies will take like over a year. So I'm interested once we can start getting more quantitative antibody testing and how that, um, and how that lines up. They do, they do think that higher antibody levels are correlated with more severe disease because I think of this inflammation phase just kind of ramps you up and ramps you up and ramps you up. So um, there might be a, a more protective effect in longer term, but right now we can't make any comments on the durability of the antibody response. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Jen. Uh, great presentation, great discussion. Uh, we're gonna continue to move forward and now it's my privilege uh, to introduce my close friend, uh, Dr. Gorano Liga Krona, uh, who is actually the past chairman of uh, working group PCI of a Swedish uh, Society of Cardiology, a, a country we just totally done it differently than, than here, us in the uh, US. Uh, uh, Goran's a very close friend. Uh, he's a senior consulting interventional cardiologist at Skane University Hospital in Lund, uh, Sweden. Uh, and Goran is going to discuss the status of COVID-19 in Sweden, insights uh, from the outlier nation. Hello, Rash. Let me see if I can do this with the share screen here. Do you hear me? Yep, we can hear you great. Okay. Uh, let me see how I can get my own So at the bottom, if you hover at the bottom of your screen, yeah. you'll see a black strip and which has a button that says share screen. There it is. You see something here? I see it. I guess I'll try to bring it up full screen on. Okay. Everybody see this? Yep. We see great. Thank you, Raj, for organizing this. Uh, and uh, it's been some excellent presentation. I, I've learned tremendously a lot from, from listening to, to such excellent speakers and, and uh, knowledgeable colleagues. I'm going to be looking at this from a more basic side, from, from what we've done here in Sweden, what's been different here, uh, and uh, let you sort of be the judge. Uh, there's some pros, there's some cons, uh, and what's happened here. So basically, I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, we've taken a different route in Sweden compared to much of the rest of Europe, where there have been severe lockdowns. In some places, of course, where they've had a tremendous large number of cases, like Italy and France, and so on. But our next door neighbors in, in uh, Scandinavia, which Denmark and Norway and Finland, they have, have not had any lock, or they've had severe lockdowns. But uh, in Sweden, we've sort of been following what the epidemiologists have been promoting and they, uh, politicians are taking sort of the back seat and letting them be the judges of what we need to implement and not here in Sweden. And this is one of these uh, critical then uh, reviews uh, regarding Sweden as an outlier uh, among the countries in Europe, where we have quite an open society still. And this is where I live in, in southern Sweden, which is part of a more of a rural uh, area in Sweden, uh, but it's a large university hospital that covers all of southern Sweden. So what is the status is that we have not had any lockdown yet at any time, but there are restrictions. Uh, our high schools and universities are closed, but the first through ninth grade, uh, are still open and children attend school and, and nursery uh, uh, care is still open. They've stopped all large events like sporting events and other concerts and so on. They, these have been banned, but you're still allowed to assemble up to 50 people at one time. Social distancing is of course encouraged and 
is enforced in restaurants, but restaurants and stores are open, uh, but only for seated guests. But you go to shopping center, you still see lots of people there, uh, but people do practice very well social distancing. Uh, for many weeks now, or for two months, they've had uh, no visitors allowed in nursing homes. And they've never said that they wouldn't impose additional restrictions if necessary. Um, but they sort of keep a track of, of number of cases. And the key thing here is to make sure that the hospitals do not become overwhelmed. And that has been the key thing. Uh, as long as uh, hospitals are not overwhelmed, uh, they will not enforce or go to a lockdown. And we've never hit that, that point yet. So this is looking at today uh, and what's been happening in, in the deaths. And these are the deaths uh, of patients with COVID. Uh, and as you can see here, it looks possibly promising where we possibly have hit the peak. Uh, the reason these columns here uh, will, will change in the next couple of days. Uh, they are not quite trustworthy for the last couple of days. Uh, and that's why, why they have them with stripes to them. Um, if we look upon what's happened with the cases and what we see in Sweden, we have a population of 10 million people. We have 2,600 deaths and 22,000 confirmed cases. But testing has been exceedingly slow in Sweden. Our neighboring countries have been much better. Um, I don't know exactly why, and there's been a lot of discussions, but in, Sweden, in Norway, they've tested close to four times as many patients, and Denmark at least twice as many. Uh, so we have a low number of testings being performed. Uh, however, within Sweden, we have only one hotspot, and that's Stockholm, uh, which contain about a quarter of the population, but they have more than half the deaths in Sweden. Uh, if you look outside of Stockholm, uh, and I've and put in here Skåne, which is the area that I live in, uh, we do not have many deaths at all. And you can compare that to Stockholm. So we are probably in Skåne close to uh, at well above half the population in Stockholm, but very little effect down here. If you look upon Sweden, and this is the number of cases, and you compare this to what it looks like in the world, you can see Sweden here, and Tyskland is actually Germany. You see the US up here, but this is the number of cases. This is not the cases according to the population or per million. Uh, but you can see Denmark and Finland and Norway, which are down here, are, are have a much lower number of deaths. We compare then the number of dead per million. Uh, you can see Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, this is Germany, US, Italy, Spain, UK. Uh, look at the deaths in the UK, which are 414 or 415 deaths per million. In Sweden, we have 260. In the US, you're currently at 198. Uh, Italy will have a large number of deaths. But the neighboring countries of Norway and Denmark have far fewer deaths per million, but they have also been under lockdown. The question which is going to happen is what happens when you move away from lockdown? Uh, will the cases soar or not? Uh, we don't know, but we will see, I guess, in the next coming weeks or months. So with, I talked about the, the hospitals being overwhelmed. Uh, even in Stockholm, which is our hotspot, uh, we've never been above really 80% uh, of, ma of maximum capacity. We have a military hospital in, in Stockholm with over 500 beds. It's never been used so far. Uh, they've quadrupled the number of intensive care beds in Stockholm and also in most areas in Sweden. It's been a huge increase in the number of cases. And this is where you can see and find then the number of cases that are in the ICU right now. We have 514 patients in Sweden in the ICU. If you can look upon the change from the last couple of days and compared to last week. So it's going down. And here you can see the patients, the median age is 60 of a patient in the ICU. And the median days from onset of symptoms until they went into the ICU is almost 11 days almost 75% of patients do have some kind of a risk factor. 
so what happens? These are the new, unique patients admitted to the ICU in all of Sweden, uh, and going then back from the beginning of April uh, and even to March. And you can see that the new, unique patient in the ICU is actually trending downwards. And these last couple of days are somewhat uncertain, um, but the older uh, group of or days here, I, I think they're quite you can trust for them. Goran, can I uh, interrupt you for a second? Sure. Uh, uh, the, Dimitri uh, from Greece uh, just sent a message to you that um, please put your screen in a presentation view. Okay. You can only see half of the slide. Okay, sorry. Uh, let me see if I can do that. Is this? Uh, no, I don't. I think. Let's see if I can bring it up like this. No. Corin, are you? Uh, do you, you have a two? Before, and a regular PowerPoint was was um, uh, was correct. Corin, do you have? Are you using a two-screen computer? Uh, yes. Do you think? But, well, let me see then, if I can then the problem is that you need to go to the other screen. Okay. Let's see what happens when I do this. You see better now? No, because you're in the uh, in the uh, slide sort of view. Go to your presentation view of the PowerPoint and then share it with the other screen. Okay. So I should go back to the PowerPoint you said. You're in the PowerPoint yeah. mode, but your other computer, share it with yes, your so other screen. So see this button here, this button here, the one that you normally use to go on a large uh, right. yeah. mode, that's the one you need. Okay. At the bottom right. The other thing is that uh, that's it. That's there it. you go. Okay, good. Thank you. So did, you did you see? Uh, let's see if I can get. So you see, this is, did you see the last slide that I showed of the all the new unique patients that were coming yeah. in? Yeah. yeah. So this is the entire Sweden which meant that at some point in the, the middle of April, the case new patients that entered the ICU has been trending downwards. And if you look upon the current status of all patients currently in the ICU, they are still fairly full, uh, but they are trending downwards at this point in the graph slightly. And if you can then compare what it looks like in different areas, you can see this is the Stockholm. This has been our big hotspot. And they've made a pretty you know, reasonable turnaround here and cases are definitely trending downwards, but they still have a lot of patients in Stockholm area, over 200, or close to 200 patients cases are still in the ICU. So you see a reduction in the number of new patients coming into the ICU, but of course these patients stay there for quite a while. And therefore, uh, the trend will, will, you know, probably in the near future, we'll see the total number of cases going more significantly down. This is what it looks like in my ICU or in southern Sweden. And you can see there are very, very few patients here uh, that have been admitted. Uh, we've had just a few days that were above two patients, new, unique patients. But in our ICU, we have over 20 patients that are, are in the hospital uh, with, and it takes a while to, to uh, get these patients off the ventilators. So uh, another interesting aspect that you know, we can follow patients in the SCAR registry uh, and our angioplasty registries. And we've also started looking at uh, comparing the number of infarcts we see now compared to reference dates uh, at different years. And here, what we can see is that uh, starting in the, in the end of February, when we had our first 14 number of cases presented in the hospitals, uh, on this curve, you can see that the number of infarcts, the patients seeking hospital healthcare for infarcts starts to go down compared to the reference time period, which was in 2015. 4th of March was when there were more than 10,000 cases reported in Europe. 
And 11th of March was when our uh, national healthcare services started issuing warnings about community spread. And it was the 18th or uh, 18th of March when uh, visits were disallowed to nursing homes. So in Stockholm, which is the hotspot, this is STEMI patients. And you can see that there's a drop of the number of STEMI patients that were sent to the healthcare services uh, compared to 2015. Uh, somewhat different figures for the N STEMI patients, but also there you see a reduction. So um, I'm just going to sort of let you draw your own conclusions about this, what we see here. Uh, it seems that we are over the peak. We now have an R value that the reproduction rate, which is below 1.0 since April 21, which means that there are few, one person will uh, infect fewer than one other person, which means and suggests that we could see the end of the current, current wave uh, of the pandemic, although there is you know, more waves most likely to come in the future. Uh, lockdowns may be useful, but uh, we think that only the point when healthcare systems risk becoming overburdened. And uh, there has to be some kind of an exit strategy when you go to a lockdown. There's such large regional variabilities in, in this pandemic. And uh, we think that, you know, if you're not in a scenario where you, your healthcare system risks being overwhelmed, then you probably should keep uh, you know, part, many parts of the society open, uh, of course, social distancing and so on, but uh, keep stores, uh, restaurants open, because we need to keep our economy going. Otherwise, we're not going to have any, any, you know, pay, I mean, if we're going to have to get on with life. Otherwise, uh, we're going to be in a complete disaster. Sweden is continuing its open approach despite this criticism and we will not know if this is the right approach or not until probably months or more likely years from now. We think that approximately 500,000 people in Stockholm uh, have had the infection. 25% uh, of the population uh, have antibodies. And this is of course due to, from, you know, not all these patients have been tested as a people, but it's the, from the uh, Sentinel sort of testing in smaller groups of uh, the part of the population. Outside of Stockholm, there's only a slow but steady rise in the cases, and uh, the healthcare systems outside of Stockholm are in a quite okay situation. And my knowledge from Swedes and how they normally are, I think this next image is sort of what the, this is from many years ago, but people made a joke about the Scandinavians and their sort of natural social distancing. And this is then Swedes waiting for the bus in Sweden, and you compare, compare it to the, in Argentina, and this is before the COVID pandemic. So with that, thank you very much for your attention, and thank you in Rosh and, and the C Academy for organizing this very, very nice uh, webcast. Great, Goran, thank you. So we have a couple, only a couple of questions. Uh, one question is from Dr. Isha uh, Kader. Uh, are you seeing late presenters with complications of MI, uh, VSD, et cetera, because of the COVID? In my hospital, to my knowledge, uh, very, very few. I, I, I have not seen any of those cases. Not to, you know, something that is out of the ordinary. In other words, you always have patients that some time, time you know, show up on occasion, which are re re late presenters. But it's not a, any, what I think, an increase. Any other questions from any other panel members uh, for Goran before we move on to our last presentation? Okay, um, so let's uh, move on now. Uh, it's my uh, honor to have a C3 course co director, uh, Dr. Sandeep Nathan, uh, who is Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Chicago and also Medical Director of the Cardiac Intensive Care Unit. 
and director of the Interventional Cardiology Fellowship Program and a co-director of the Cardiac Catheterization uh, Laboratory. Uh, Sandeep's been very uh, involved in, in the front line of uh, COVID patients, and he will now discuss uh, cardiac manifestations and role of the interventional cardiologist in COVID-19 pandemic. He also is writing a, a review article for Heart International, uh, which I am uh, co-chief editor for. That will be uh, out soon as well. Uh, so welcome, Sandeep. Uh, uh, looking forward to your uh, uh, presentation now. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Raj. Um, uh, see lots of uh, friends on the on the call. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you see the screen? Yeah, we see uh, perfectly. Oh. We also hear you perfectly. Okay, oh, terrific. Good. good. So, you know, this is a sort of a broad question. What's the role of the interventional cardiologist during the COVID-19 pandemic? I think we're all being flexed to do things that are outside of our comfort zone and perhaps even outside of our specialties. I think, you know, the, the real heroes within the institution are the folks that are going in and out of the COVID units uh, every single day. And, and we're sort of playing a supportive role, but I want to frame uh, some of the ways we're we're doing that um, uh, at uh, at this institution and others. I think everyone has uh, their own version of the uh, the origin story, uh, if you will. Um, uh, many different theories as to how this actually came to be. What we know for sure is that uh, in mid uh, December 2019, uh, a cluster of patients were identified in Wuhan in Hubei Province. Uh, and then this was disclosed to the WHO in, uh, at the end of December. Uh, this seems like such a long time ago, but you know, we're, we're literally talking about less than six months ago. Uh, January 19th marked the transmission of the virus uh, from uh, Wuhan to, uh, to Washington State. Uh, this became patient zero in the United States. And regrettably, uh, the first human to human transmission that's been confirmed actually happened here in Illinois outside of uh, Chicago. Uh, in, uh, in Hoffman Estates, uh, two uh, uh, individuals, both in their 60s, uh, became uh, infected, one uh, being a traveler from, uh, from Wuhan. Um, Omar showed some, uh, some uh, screenshots of this dashboard, which I think is a, a really important way to sort of keep your eyes on multiple balls at the same time. Um, this is where we are this morning. It's, it's really staggering what has, uh, what has happened uh, as uh, COVID has sort of engulfed the world and uh, swept across. And this was data that actually posted on CNN yesterday. Uh, very interesting, the, the dash lines are a uh, five-day moving average. And there's lots of reasons why you may have different slopes and trajectories. Many of the speakers, I think, touched upon this. Uh, but there are still eight cities or territories that are on the rise. And that may be because of clustering of cases. It may be because of more testing. Uh, but suffice it to say that for us as practitioners, this is going to be here for a long time to come. We're going to be dealing with the blowback from this for a long time to come, even after the curve starts to flatten and, uh, and downtrend. So what are the key issues for interventional cardiologists to focus on during COVID-19? We've all got a lot of balls in the air. Um, I think first and foremost, we have to recognize, prioritize, and facilitate all the medically urgent non-COVID cases that we're, we were doing and sort of taking for granted uh, up until we became, uh, you know, uh, sort of captive to this resource-constrained environment. We have to provide primary PCI services for STEMIs, uh, irrespective of COVID uh, or PUI status, in my opinion, uh, treat complications or uh, of missed or uh, late presentation STEMIs, um, uh, recognize non-ischemic ST elevation when that uh, confronts us and, and uh, finally provide uh, MCS and uh, ECMO support for critically ill patients. So the first issue is uh, prioritizing the folks who have been put on the back burner in the midst of this pandemic. Um, this is sort of our institutional viewpoint or approach uh, in uh, increasing order of importance um, going from patients who have sort of a routine assessment, ischemic evaluation for decompensated heart failure or some non-sustained VT that was picked up on a device interrogation, uh, all the way up to folks who are having unstable angina and trying to weather it at home or tavern and mitral clip patients who are actively decompensating uh, and then uh, and uh, some other uh, uh, cohorts as well. 
Um, this is a, an interesting paper, I think a useful paper that was put together by some of my surgical colleagues here at the University of Chicago. This is the MENT score, Medically Necessary Time Sensitive Procedures, and it's based on surgical procedures that require OR time. Uh, and the authors, uh, led by Vivek Prashant, um, sort of stratified the need for different procedures and the risk to the operators and, uh, and the staff uh, based on procedural factors, disease factors, and patient factors. And as you see the spectrum, if you have a low MEN score, uh, it's okay to proceed. Uh, and a high MEN score, the procedure is not justified. Obviously, there's a subjective component of this, but at least in terms of calibrating everybody's uh, language about uh, what merits going uh, in, uh, in the time of COVID, I think this is a really important step forward. And some of my colleagues are actually working on a, uh, an adaptation of the score for catheter-based procedures uh, as well. So the second issue is providing primary PCI services for ST elevation MI. And this is, of course, a controversial issue. Um, the practical considerations when you're taking somebody with ACS or STEMI to the cath lab is that everyone is a potential PUI, given the high rate of asymptomatic community transmission. But you have to ask yourself, how likely is a patient to be actively infected and spreading droplets? How urgent is the, is the actual procedure? Um, is this true myocardial injury? Is this uh, a type one uh, uh, MI? Uh, what's the likelihood that they're going to uh, spread aerosol during the procedure, uh, and could this be could this be something else? Um, I think we've all observed this anecdotally, and there's been now a couple of papers on this documenting the precipitous drop in uh, the incidence of STEMIs the world over. This was the uh, report from Spain. 81 STEMI uh, centers in uh, 17 regions of Spain documented a 40% drop in their uh, PCI for uh, for STEMI volume. Uh, and this was largely mirrored in uh, a paper that was just uh, uh, published or is in press, 38% reduction in STEMI at nine U.S. centers uh, that are relatively high volume centers after the start of the, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. There was initial, uh, initially some uh, clinical guidance from the, uh, the ACC really sort of framing out this issue of who are the patients at risk? What are the actual uh, uh, known risks, particularly in patients with cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular risk factors? Um, and then uh, the acute cardiac complications of uh, COVID-19. This was in February. In uh, March, uh, SCAI released uh, a position uh, statement uh, on uh, the management of these patients, in large part supporting uh, uh, primary PCI for, uh, for STEMI and medical management for stable non-STEMI patients. And most recently, a joint document from the American College of Cardiology, uh, SCAI, and the American College of Emergency Physicians uh, supporting uh, primary PCI for the management of acute myocardial infarction, so long as you can meet uh, some performance metrics as well as the ability to keep uh, uh, physicians and staff uh, and the uh, institution safe. So um, Jeff did a really great job on, uh, on uh, donning and doffing. And I texted him, I said, honestly, uh, that's mm -hmm. probably the best talk that I've heard on the, uh, on the subject. And, and this meeting so far has been the best Zoom meeting I've actually uh, attended, I think, in, in the past month and a half. Um, what does it mean to actually uh, be able to do this in a reliable fashion? Uh, first and foremost, a dedicated COVID PUI cath lab with a terminal clean, uh, clean process in place, 24-7. Uh, reverse airflow and biplane suite is uh, what we have that's capable of switch hitting between uh, uh, cardiovascular procedures as well as neurointerventional procedures. And this is a shared resource with our colleagues in interventional radiology. As you can see, there's an ante room for, for donning and doffing, uh, as well as a, a separate door uh, uh, across from the ante room for patient entry and exit. Prepackaged equipment so that you can just sort of grab and go. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, turn into this scavenger hunt. Uh, and then if everything uh, goes right and you can make it through the entire case without uh, infecting yourself or infecting somebody else, uh, it's definitely a, a bit of a victory uh, to actually make it through safely. Um, treating the complications of uh, missed or late presentation STEMIs has become a uh, topic of discussion, and uh, the last uh, question was, was a good one about this, uh, about uh, seeing this in uh, Sweden and uh, other parts of the world. Um, you know, the, the folks who are glass half full would say, well, there's less travel, lower pollution, less social interaction. Maybe that equates to fewer triggers for ischemic events. 
uh, there is certainly a dramatically lower incidence of STEMIs worldwide, so maybe other bad things are happening in fewer numbers. The glass half empty folks would say that there's limited access to routine medical care and the fear of being exposed is uh, uh, inducing patients to avoid medical contact even when there's serious issues. Maybe there's a cumulative effect of all of the COVID related conditions that folks are weathering at home uh, and uh, maybe we're just not seeing the late complications of STEMI. There's an active conversation on Twitter as many of you may know. Uh, Jamie McCabe posted this uh, about a week ago uh, sort of posing to uh, the Twitterverse, uh, is anyone seeing it? And, uh, and folks have sort of tweeted uh, the, uh, the different types of late complications. And certainly some of these, uh, I, I gotta be honest, are, are really sort of relegated, have been relegated to the history books and uh, uh, textbooks and, and not seen in the era of primary PCI. And uh, you have to infer that perhaps some of this is, uh, is uh, observer bias, but some of this may be real as well. Um, this is real. This was just published a couple of days ago in the New England Journal as a, as a research correspondence. Out of hospital cardiac arrests have gone up very dramatically in uh, the hardest hit parts of uh, Italy, as you can see here, a 58% increase uh, in out of hospital cardiac arrests as compared with the same period uh, before. And the cumulative incidence of uh, cardiac arrest in 2020 was strongly uh, associated with the cumulative incidence of COVID-19 during that same period of time. So this is a very worrisome uh, signal. Um, here's a patient that we uh, took about a month ago, uh, which I think uh, sort of illustrates this issue, 68-year-old, uh, excuse me, 60-year-old female with no real past medical history brought in with, um, you know, this infectious prodrome, flu-like symptoms, body aches, and so forth. She'd been having increasing chest discomfort for a couple of days, but she came in when it was just unbearable. You can see that she already has a QS pattern with ST elevation uh, on her anterior precordial leads. And uh, before uh, much could be done, uh, she arrested uh, in the ER and just had repeated PEA arrests uh, with, uh, you know, without the ability to, uh, to regain any ROSC. Of course, this was about uh, a month and a half ago, and uh, it, was, uh, it was fairly chaotic until uh, we could sort of uh, get a handle on uh, you know, what to do next. Anyway, we got her up to the cath lab. You can already see that the first blood gas that was drawn uh, you know, before she even arrested uh, looked just uh, terrible, uh, arrived maxed on three pressors, more uh, uh, arrests, uh, and despite uh, uh, extensive efforts to resuscitate and uh, fix her completely occluded LAD. Uh, she remained in shock resistant VF. Uh, under the instruction of the family, uh, we uh, you know, unfortunately stopped the, uh, the uh, resuscitation process and, uh, and she expired. And, and you know, one wonders in uh, another time frame, would she have come in much earlier than, uh, than she did? The last piece of this is providing mechanical circulatory support and, uh, and ECMO support for critically ill COVID-19 patients. Um, ELSO has put out uh, the final version of their guidance document very recently. This is available uh, for access online. And it really sort of maps out the different uh, contraindications, relative and absolute, and then sort of uh, poses this uh, flow diagram for how one might consider uh, our institutional criteria is a bit simplified from that. The exclusion criteria, which are not uh, hard and fast, but um, something that we would need to talk about if we're violating them. Uh, age uh, 50 or older, uh, BMI greater than 30, active smoking, or known significant comorbidities in the setting of critical illness and uh, ventilatory failure despite all of the initial therapeutic maneuvers by our pulmonary critical care colleagues uh, would buy them out of ECMO. There are some supporting considerations, an ECMO card in the cath lab or outside the COVID ICU, go kits, dedicated uh, ultrasounds for the uh, COVID units, on-call perfusionists and ECMO specialists and so forth. Uh, we generally have one to two circuits that are wet primed and ready to go. And as you can see here, we bundled up all of our supplies because the stuff that goes into the COVID unit doesn't come back out uh, of, the, uh, of the COVID unit. So these are all the, uh, the the high frequency disposables uh, that are bundled up and uh, uh, like everything like the PPE, uh, they're basically grab and go uh, if you need to go do this at the bedside. Our preferred cannulation strategy, we can keep it simple. We try to keep it simple. Uh, it's um, a 25 French uh, vented venous cannula shown in the, in the middle from the leg 
uh, and then a 19 French uh, arterial cannula as a return into the V, uh, basically at the SVCRA junction uh, for providing ventilatory uh, support of these patients. This is a PUI that I did in the cath lab. Uh, turned out uh, his, uh, his uh, ARDS was actually influenza uh, in the middle of uh, in the middle of all of this he was uh, he ended up being COVID negative but he was treated as a PUI at the time um, and occasionally more exotic and uh, involved strategies are required this is uh, a COVID positive patient uh, who is um, uh, being supported with a uh, tandem uh, Protec duo as an oxy RVAD and then a separate uh, venous cannula uh, from below uh, cut into the oxygenator as well as a uh, balloon pump. So um, I think that, you know, I can sort of summarize this by saying that we're all sort of figuring it out as we go along. But, uh, you know, when Raj asked me to, to give this talk and I'm very happy to do it, um, I thought, you know, what are the, the sort of key things that we provide? Uh, and I thought uh, that's, uh, that's sort of a summary of some of the things that have been going on for the past uh, month and a half or so at, uh, at our, at our uh, institution. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Sandeep, Sandeep, that was great. Thank you uh, for uh, outstanding uh, presentation. Um, uh, Guran, uh, uh, there is a question from uh, the audience to you and uh, Sandeep: Is that is there a difference in the threshold for ECMO between U.S. and 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 Europe about who should get it? Good question. I don't know, Sandeep. Uh, I, I know you're very experienced in putting patients on ECMO. Uh, we are a little bit more limited here in Sweden. Uh, what do you think? Um, you know, it's a, it's a great question. I don't know that anybody's really compared notes, and I think we probably should. I mean, I think that's a research question right there. Um, I think what's important when considering ECMO is, is uh, you know, three things, right? One is knowing that all of the conventional treatments have already been optimized. Um, ECMO in these cases are not the, it's not the big red easy button, right? It should not be thought of as the big red easy button because the outcomes are pretty miserable, uh, particularly for critically ill patients. Um, that's issue number one. Issue number two, I think, is that uh, there has to be due consideration of the overall trajectory uh, of the patient and hope is not a form of medical evidence, right? I hope this person turns around once they put them on, we put them on ECMO is not really a scientifically robust statement, but we make it all the time, right? Uh, we all do it. Uh, and then the third point I think is that there has to be joint decision making. And so um, our shock team and uh, uh, our ECMO team are basically one and the same uh, at this point. Um, and so there is joint decision making between the intensivists that are taking care of these critically ill patients, the interventional cardiologist, the cardiac thoracic surgeon, uh, and, uh, and some of the other, uh, you know, supporting physicians and medical personnel. And so we all sort of put our heads together. This is not just sort of a one person decides approach. I think it varies a lot in the United States from one institution to the next, depending on the bandwidth, the number of circuits you have. Omar talked about the number of circuits. This is sort of a, you know, there's a, there's a, a daily um, uh, uh, phone in on, uh, on some of these uh, issues and the resources. And early on, you know, we basically, you know, had to confront a frightening truth that we only have, we're not able to get disposables. We may have circuits, but we don't have enough disposables and we can't get any more disposables. Um, I think that's gotten better, but uh, you know we are still very much resource constrained and trying to be selective. Yeah, we we, uh, we yeah. have uh, a few patients on ECMO in the hospital in, in Sweden, and uh, I think we're sort of reaching. We're not there yet, but but we still have availability to put some more patients on ECMO. But these spend a lot of time on. I mean, this is not days we're talking about. These are many weeks much longer usually than your ventilators alone. So you have to make a decision on what you think the long-term outcome is going to be for this patient. Is it reasonable to expect that this patient will uh, perhaps survive? Or is this something you're just doing to hope? But if you're doing it only because of your hope, then uh, that patient is going to take up a lot of resources that could possibly have been spent on other patients with, with a better trajectory. 
You know, I think that in the United States, this is the first time, certainly in my career, there are more uh, experienced and senior practitioners on the call and in the audience, but this is certainly the first time in my career in the past 25 years that we've had to actually count anything. And we've had to, you know, we've had to say, if uh, we do this, then that's one less for somebody else. And I know that that's the way the majority of the world has ever, you know, has always had to practice. Uh, and I think it's just been very humbling for us as U.S. operators. There is a question from uh, Dr. Tanvi Rab uh, from Emory. There are some reports of VV ECMO only and permissive hypoxemia before intubation. Any thoughts, Sandeep? Yeah, we've not. Um, that's a great question, uh, Tanvi. Um, uh, it's uh, you know, it's not something that we have uh, adopted, um, and you know, we've we've certainly talked about this. But you know, on one end of the conversation, you're saying. You know, we're saying that we don't have enough to go around for the most critically ill patients. Um, on the other end of the conversation, we're all acknowledging that perhaps we're starting all of these things too late when, you know, when uh, uh, folks have uh, become unsalvageable. Um, I'd love to see some data on that. I, I haven't, uh, I haven't actually uh, seen that, and uh, and and we're not, we're still reserving it as sort of a, you know, a therapy after other therapies have been exhausted. Dr. Chambers? I was going to ask you kind of the drill if you go through how many um, ECMO machines do you have? What's your backup? Have you gone through that drill? We did, and how many do you have in the system and that sort of thing? And then we actually have a committee that make choices for us, kind of an ethics committee. Do you have anything like that? Yeah, we don't have a formal ethics committee in place for this issue. Um, I think that uh, the number of circuits and the capacity. Um, has not been the huge issue as much as, you know, case selection. You know, we sort of geared up to this thing that um, we're not going to be able to, you know, support all these patients, but, you know, with some selection uh, in place, it's been okay. I think the, the, you know, the new variable in this is that as we sort of apply the men's score and start opening up the ORs, and start doing urgent non-emergent cases and even elective cases, some of those circuits are gonna be uh, tied up for that. We're starting to see you know, the, the transfers for uh, both capital-based procedures and operations had largely gone away and that's starting to come back now. So you know, the endocarditis patient with, uh, you know, with uh, wide open AI that needs to go to the OR now, COVID negative, but you know, can't wait until, you know, uh, until later. So, um, it's it's a little bit of a sliding scale, and uh, you know we have sort of a daily call in about this uh, about this issue. Great. So, um, uh, uh, Goran, you have a question? Yes, I thank you. Great presentation as always, Sandy. And uh, but one thing that I just sort of you, you made me think a little bit is also uh, we see these patients, you know, more patients coming in with cardiac arrest. Uh, do you think this is possibly one of the sort of explanations of where the missing stem eyes go? Yeah, you know, uh, Joran, that's a it's a it's a great question, and uh, you know, I think in the back of everybody's minds, we were afraid that this is what was happening that people were weathering their their STEMI at home and coming in, you know, uh, coming in much worse off. I I don't, you know, I have to confess that I'm in the glass half empty camp. Uh, believing that as opposed to, you know, the trigger hypothesis that they're just not having these STEMIs and, you know, their, their mandatory vacation was, was good for their cardiovascular health. I, I, don't, I don't think that that's the case. Um, the thing that I'm sort of struck with, not for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, but I think that for all the cardiovascular manifestations is that, you know, there are vast differences in phenotype. Uh, in the United States, you know, uh, from Chicago, it seems like there's New York and the rest of the United States in terms of acuity of illness, death on the ventilator. You saw the Northwell publication recently. You know, that is just terrifying. Even if there's missing data, 88% mortality once you get vented for COVID is just astonishing and terrifying. And it just seems like there's big phenotypic differences. All of the discussion about um, about fulminant myocarditis, we haven't seen very much of that. Um, I think that Dr. Mara made a great point that, you know, some of this may look pretty normal on an echo and you have to dig uh, deeper and, and sort of pull the sheets back to, to see what's actually going on. Um, but, you know, it's very, it, it almost seems like an entire spectrum of diseases as it 
affects you know cardiovascular conditions it doesn't seem to be sort of one size fits all and, and we can sort of apply each other's data to one another's i don't know i have anybody on the call that uh, feels differently or has ideas about that Goran, uh, uh, I agree. A, a question from the audience about herd immunity. That is the Sweden's approach based on a principle of herd immunity. It's, it's a good question. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of talk about herd immunity and, uh, you know, our sort of epidemiologists who, who are sort of uh, advising the government and, and how to handle this pandemic in Sweden. Um, are not coming out and saying that is their eventual goal. Uh, but, you know, you'd have to think that this is somehow the eventual goal, regardless of what they say, uh, because they are letting the, the, the virus sort of being transmitted throughout the population, but in a, in a fairly controlled manner. In other words, uh, they've never said to do that they were not going to go to lockdowns and so on, but they, they're, they actually seem quite okay with, the way it's progressing right now. And, and so their unstated sort of goal is probably uh, that they're looking to for herd immunity. Although we don't have any conclusive evidence yet if, if this is a lasting immunity that you might, might may or may not get. Although I did see today that from South Korea, there's some more information coming out that they are being more certain that, that this is going to be an extended type of immunity uh, this was just sort of a brief news report, so I can't say anything more than than, than promising data, perhaps. Um, there is another issue that has been raised uh, is um, uh, that a uh, lot of areas like Sweden, you know, we heard from Omar Latif from Chicago, Sandeep from Chicago, that uh, the reason why there has been a severe lockdown is uh, because there was a risk of overwhelming the healthcare system. However, that, you know, that's really the most affected you know, city with that is, is New York. And there's a question for Dr. Ballar, who's a vascular surgeon in New York, and really in the heart of the, this whole epidemic is you know, that it, why isn't New York have enough beds or you know, is there a reason for uh, New York being completely overrun? Uh, Raj, thank you for that question. And I think, uh, first of all, I need to congratulate everybody that participated and presented such a great uh, data that's just relevant at this time. It's hard to get any data, especially when you're in New York. There's so much of stuff going on. and we don't even understand the disease. If you uh, look at the data, there's 90% people dying when they go on to ventilator. So was it worth putting them on ventilator or which are the 10% that we make a difference would be worth it. And the panic that we had during this time frame raises a fundamental question as to what is the way to deliver the best healthcare and having this large mega institution has drifted away from the community centers and we panic so much that if we go a little bit back in time, we had a burger commission that had told us we had too many beds and we needed to control the cost of healthcare and they closed exactly 4,000 beds. And if you look at the recent history, the additional number of beds that they created were 4,000. I mean, we had to question the way we deliver the healthcare. Instead of having large mega institution, it may be time to create community hospitals with smaller bed size, but to have access to community centers where you can isolate easily, especially in this kind of pandemic. If we had each community of 10 to 50,000 people having one small hospital with 50 beds, we would not be in a panic mode. So the healthcare delivery in the United States is very different and it raises a fundamental question as to, do we really need tertiary care hospitals and eliminate all community hospitals from existence? Similar to the questions that we always ask, would you close a, a fire station because there are not enough fires? 
that was the logic given to us during the time of closures of the community hospitals that we didn't utilize all the beds and that's why we need to close them. And the ratio in Brooklyn for per thousand population, there's 1.6 beds. Then on an average, usually the required rate of bed per thousand in anywhere in the world is about six beds per thousand population. Imagine when you have 1.6, you would be panicking. The national average in the United States has gone down to 2.6 in our attempt to reduce the length of stay and reduce the beds. But it was a politically mismanaged situation trying to control the cost because state had to pay 40% of Medicaid dollars. And that's where all the politicians agreed to lower the bed. And now we are paying the price. And we still didn't utilize, look at the panic it created. This was just a pandemic. If we have a terrorist attack or bio, uh, bio weapon that would lead to this kind of problems, where would we stand? We can't create all these things within weeks or days. So it's definitely something to think about. I don't know what the panel has thoughts about. And just wanted to make one comment. Jeff, your comments about doing elective cases and all the mandated stuff that we utilize. CDC and JCO has been missing from the action. I haven't seen anybody coming into the hospital trying to guide us what to do, but they have mandates that are way out of range when you're doing elective surgeries, but they are nowhere to be found at this time. So I don't know if we really need them. You know, I'll agree with that 100%, and, and I'll, I'll second that with a, a lot of the things they put in, in place are actually barriers to, living, to delivering uh, rapid care in this setting. No, I, I agree with that. They, they, you know, the, every time there is a uh, JCO inspection, you know, they came up with the most insane comments about and make, you know, us change our workflow uh, so much that it really makes, you know, our job harder. But before uh, we uh, conclude, uh, Nilesh, I, uh, I wanted to take the opportunity just for the completeness sake to, uh, uh, to give us uh, a, a brief uh, a version on you know the vascular care in the COVID uh, pandemic uh, because I know there's been a lot of issues regarding you know uh, large venous thromboembolisms, uh, acute uh, limb ischemia, a very high rate of uh, amputations, especially in in New York City. Uh, thank you, Raj, and uh, I would want to bring attention to what Mandeep uh, Mera was telling initially that this. COVID, even though it comes through respiratory tract, it does have a systemic effect. And I would try, I mean, agree with his postulation that endo, it's an endothelial disease. And we have, on an average, as we had talked earlier, I still continue to see high levels of acute ischemias in lower limb, especially with the COVID patients, even though we try anticoagulation I am just reviewing a paper from my colleague, and I don't know where to start or where to end, whether anticoagulation is the answer to everything, but once they progress beyond a certain disease where they are on ventilators, the cascade of uh, all the cytokines is activated, and no matter what you do, uh, hypercoagulable state persists, and I haven't made a serious attempt to do any thrombolytic therapies or limb salvage issues in sick patients who are on ventilators because the outcomes are not usually worse if you have 90% mortality. Trying to save a limb at that point did not make much sense to me. And we do see a, a very significant rise in our amputation rate in the last 30 days. I have probably been doing more amputations than what I have done in the whole year in the last few days. And I don't know if there is any other solutions to that, but there is a definite effect on hypercoagulability and endothelial disease. No, I, I think that's absolutely correct. And Mandeep uh, had you know, talked uh, a lot about high dose of low molecular weight heparin in these uh, patients. 
Uh, one last question, I, I know we are uh, pretty late, uh, is for uh, Sandeep. Uh, Sandeep uh, Dimitri uh, Oznikas, uh, one of the uh, very uh, uh, prominent interventional cardiologists out in Greece, uh, says if he, ECMO is not available as in his uh, center, what do you think uh, would be the best alternative, if any? You know, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. I guess, you know, it really begs the question, what are you, what are you doing it for, right? Is it for oxygenation? Is it VV ECMO or is it uh, venal arterial ECMO? I think that if this is for hemodynamic support plus some measure of, you know, pulmonary support oxygenation, you've got a couple of different options. I think outside of the United States, you know, mechanical circulatory support in many countries is just limited to a balloon pump and, you know, We'll put that in as a vent if uh, someone is on VA ECMO, but as standalone therapy for critically ill patients, I'm not sure how much it really makes a difference. There have been some uh, some case reports of uh, use of the 55 Impella device for you know fulminant myocarditis associated with uh, COVID. I've seen at least uh, one um, that seemed uh, like uh, had sort of a favorable resolution. Uh, but I think you know for somebody that is uh, has such poor oxygenation. You know, the gentleman that I showed you, and I, uh, that was actually influenza-related ARDS. Um, you know, his, uh, his SAT was 40% uh, after all of the maneuvers, after everything uh, for, you know, uh, including uh, epoprostenol. Uh, his, uh, his SAT was 40% when we went on pump. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know that there's any substitute for that. Um, you know, once you are sort of uh, in dire straits. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I know we've been way beyond uh, our scheduled time. Uh, I, I really want to thank uh, all of our faculty uh, who has shown some tremendous patience today. Uh, uh, awesome discussion on, a, on an incredibly important topic right now, which affects everyone worldwide. Uh, so, and we have had an incredible uh, attendance here today uh, on both on Facebook Live and, and um, uh, participants here, hundreds and hundreds of uh, physicians worldwide are, are listening. So thanks everyone. Uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. Uh, I wish you all good luck and I look forward to seeing you all in the uh, near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys, uh, excellent session. Thank you. Yeah, great work in putting this together, Raj. Really good job. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Stay Have safe. A Have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Raju. Thanks. Thanks, Nilesh. <laughs>